Stargate Book presents Pranic Energy, Mystic Power of the Ancients by Julia Sanderson. Digitally narrated using the voice of Edward Herman. And the Lord God formed man, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2.7 the mystic power of the ancients can now be yours to work miracles for the rest of your life. Did the ancients really possess a secret knowledge of defying the known physical laws of the universe? Could they really perform the breathtaking feats of magic subscribed to them? Could they really have known how to slow down the aging process, control the weather, replace disease with glowing health, cast terrifying curses that would last centuries, even build fantastic towering monuments? purely by the power of thought alone? Could such secret magical knowledge of so incredible a nature has ever existed, let alone be applied? The answer to these and similar questions is an overwhelming and unhesitating yes. The ancients did possess such an astonishing secret knowledge and performed the most logic-defying of miracles by applying this knowledge. But how can we be so sure that the ancients were able to perform such fabulous miracles? The fact is that there is a mountain of evidence, documented as well as received by word of mouth, which overwhelmingly suggests that the ancients were indeed amazing wizards, who performed miracles of such breathtaking proportions that would truly make our hair stand on edge if we were to know the full extent of what they did. Secret Knowledge Rediscovered Scientific researchers and investigating occultists have discovered during this century that ancient peoples possessed an amazing secret knowledge which enabled them to perform what we would today call miracles. The existence of such secret knowledge has been beyond doubt, but what hasn't been so easy to ascertain is clarifying what became of this knowledge following the demise of the mysterious ancient miracle workers. To all intents and purposes to the outside world, this secret knowledge has been lost, gone forever from man's grasp. But the fact is that the ancient's knowledge is now no longer lost. It is again with us today. It has been rediscovered in this 20th century and found to be still actually in use in what was once one of the remotest regions of the world. What exactly this secret knowledge is and how it came to be discovered will be explained in the pages that are to follow. The implications of you receiving and applying this extraordinary secret knowledge, dear reader, are simply nothing short of fantastic. You are now about to receive secret information, miracle working knowledge that could completely turn your entire life upside down to the good, should you wish it to be so. And by turning your life upside down, we do not mean an existence of chaos, but instead the power to transform your life into that which you want it to be. For many readers whose lives are full of limitation and despair application of this secret knowledge will mean a literal upside-down change in their lives, as they move from a mental environment of despair and hopelessness to a shining new life of accomplishment, happiness, and wealth. Amazing occult powers now about to be yours. From the moment you have finished reading this book, you will have completely in your hands the power to change any undesirable circumstance in your life. You will possess wonderful occult powers and the incredible secret knowledge of the ancients that will make you absolutely irresistible in your quest to achieve the things that you want. This book is your key to using the great and mighty power of the ancients. Study carefully its instruction, take notes for it contains the esoteric information that can and will transform your life and circumstances forever. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Chapter 1. The Incredible Kahunas, Wonder Workers of the Ancient World To explain the religious beliefs and magical practices of the ancients would require many volumes of heavy reading. The purpose of this book is to present the reader with a simplified form of magic working, based upon what has been recovered of the lost secret knowledge. When we speak of the ancients, we can be said to be referring to those peoples of antiquity, usually dating from the time of the Romans backwards. And we are referring not so much to the peoples themselves, but rather to their temple priests and holy men. One immediately thinks of the great high priests and priestesses of the Near Orient, in particular those of the fabulous old Egypt. Not all the religious practitioners of those far-off days were magicians. Only a tiny few of them were. But amazing miracle workers with powers to control the elements, heal the sick, cause ill to enemies, they were indeed. Powerful ancient magic found where it was least expected. 
but it is not the ancient Egyptians to whom we are first going to concern ourselves with here. Our attention is to be directed to a most unlikely source of ancient magic, far removed from the Near Orient. Removed from the Near Orient, in fact, by a distance of no less than 10,000 miles. It is to Hawaii, in the midst of the vast Pacific Ocean, that we must turn to in order to discover the secret of the amazing wonders of the Oriental ancients. The Hawaiian Islands were for thousands of years the home of an extraordinary group of people known as the Kahunas. Today they are believed to be totally extinct, but at the turn of this century, there was reckoned to be still some of them alive, practicing their mysterious art. It is not for any reason of levity that these Kahunas have been called extraordinary miracle workers. They were believed to be the only group of people in the entire world to be practicing the very same mind-boggling magic of the high priests of ancient Egypt in use over 3,000 years ago. It is from what has been learnt of the highly secret magic of the Kahunas that forms the basis of the simplified method of magic and psychology to be presented in this book. Remarkable Works of the Kahunas By why the Kahunas? Just who were they? And what have a primitive people, removed by 10,000 miles from the land of the ancient Egyptians, to do with an advanced and sophisticated system of psychological and magical practice? These amazing people have baffled and astounded modern researchers since the word of their remarkable magical works came to light over a century ago. What made them such an object of awe throughout the Hawaiian Islands was the extraordinary power they seemed to possess for influencing and controlling visible, as well as invisible agencies. The few scientific authorities privileged to witness their magical works saw hair-raising feats of men walking on burning hot coals without sustaining even the slightest injury, injured persons' broken bones healed within seconds, wild savage man-eating animals made to turn and run, and other astonishing marvels, all without the aid of any instruments whatsoever. Even whole groups of very sick people, given up as beyond cure by the medical authorities, were seen to be all cured simultaneously and instantaneously by just one kahuna woman. Add to these documented eyewitness accounts reports of barren women becoming pregnant, persons dying of death curses, men mysteriously and suddenly growing wealthy overnight, it is not difficult to understand why these handful of kahuna miracle workers gained such awe and respect from everyone who came into contact with them. What makes the kahunas different? However, one may ask why are the kahunas so special when similar reports of magical feats amongst primitive peoples are received from everywhere in the world. What separates the kahunas from the witch doctors and magical practitioners of other primitive societies is their extremely advanced system of psychology, a system of psychology that makes Freud look childish. It is a system of psychology that has never been found anywhere else and is especially remarkable for its striking similarities to the ancient cultures and magical traditions of Egypt, India, Japan, and others. And neither did these strange kahunas miracle workers just happen to be in Hawaii. It was not their original home in spite of their residence there for many centuries. So just who were they? And from where did they originally come? The kahunas baffled everyone who tried to understand their works and demystify their origins. However, the bits and pieces of information concerning kahuna origins that have been put together over the years have led to some startling conclusions, which we shall consider in a few moments. The kahunas, to correctly define them, were the pagan holy men, or priests, of the Polynesian speaking peoples. The word kahuna is a joining together of the two Polynesian words ka and huna. Ka means keeper and huna means secret. So, a kahuna is a keeper of the secret. But a keeper of what secret? The secret to the kahunas was the hidden art of miracles. It was the ancient or forbidden knowledge, the hidden knowledge of the, the wise ones. The kahunas, or keepers of the secret, were highly revered persons in the Hawaiian community, respected and feared because of their mysterious knowledge and practices. But how did they come by this knowledge? Nobody seems to know. The kahunas passed it from father to son, mother to daughter, for generation after generation, century after century. It was never written down being passed only through the secret language of Huna, which was never understood by the ordinary Polynesians. For the kahunas jealously guarded the secret. 
No one was going to get handed on a plate what they had managed to conceal and preserve for thousands of years. A few outsiders, most notably the well-known Huna authority Max Freedom Long, were taken into their confidence, but then only after many years of tactful and persevering attempts of friendship on the part of those concerned. Some of the secrets still missing. It is sad to say that even in spite of the research into the Kahuna's magic over the last 100 or so years, still not enough is known about it. We know but only a fraction, although a very important fraction of the immense working knowledge that these very unusual people possessed. What we do know is that their advanced concepts of the soul and their great stress on the value of pranic energy form a very valid basis for understanding the mystery of their great works. But the mystery of the kahunas takes on an even more exciting and absorbing aspect when one pieces together the various stories and reports regarding their alleged origins. The most revealing clue that we have to unlocking their mysterious past is not to be found in any of the Pacific Islands, but instead halfway across the other side of the world in the remoteness of the Atlas Mountains of Northwest Africa. The North African Connection In his monumental work on Huna, the secret science behind miracles, Max Freedom long tells the story of one, Reginald Stewart, an Englishman who was a respected authority on the customs and traditions of the tribes of North Africa. After many years of study and research in the Atlas Mountains, Stewart became very engrossed in what appeared to be a very complex and advanced system of religious and magical beliefs practiced by a tiny tribe of the Berber people. With his own eyes, Stewart witnessed acts of magic performed by this people that included control of the weather, healing of the sick, control of wild animals, terrifying death curses that never failed to devastate their enemies. He became the only outsider to be taken into the confidence of these strange, remote people. What he learned from them he was to find years later, through contact with Max Freedom, long bore a striking resemblance to the magical beliefs and practices of the kahunas in far-off Hawaii. Enter the Egyptian Connection a point that was to strike Stuart very forcibly was the story these Berbers told about their origins. This was to make a special impact on Stuart many years later when he learnt of the Hawaiian magical workers through Long. This tiny tribe believed that way back in the mists of time, they were one of twelve tribes that lived in the Sahara Desert at a time when that great expanse was said to be a green and fertile land, flowing with rich and luscious rivers. The rivers dried up, so they moved eastwards into Egypt and settled on the banks of the Nile. With the passing of time, they became the nucleus of the great Egyptian civilization, using their great magical powers to help cut, carry, and place the huge building stones that formed some of the magnificent architectural feats of that ancient world, including the Great Pyramid of Giza. They were to become the rulers and masters of ancient Egypt by virtue of their mighty and awesome powers for performing magical feats. No one challenged them for fear of being on the receiving end of their terrifying powers to inflict harm. However, they were wise enough to see that a time of intellectual doom and darkness was eventually to dawn in their corner of the world. As their numbers were relatively few compared to the great masses of people they ruled, they believed that not even their wondrous powers could stave off the period of decline that lay ahead. So they decided to get out whilst the going was good. They were determined to preserve their magical knowledge at all costs and wanted to migrate to a remote region where they would be undetected and left to keep their magical tradition alive. They psychically explored the world by means of long periods of trance and decided that the massive Pacific Ocean, big, empty, and waiting, was the place for them to go. Its remoteness and vast distance from the turbulent Middle East would ensure safe and uninterrupted continuity of their sacred tradition. So they departed from Egypt, going via the Red Sea, and out eastwards into the Indian Ocean. But for some unknown reason, the Twelfth Tribe decided to go westwards by land and eventually settled in the Atlas Mountains. Evidence to Support the Berber Story One could be justified in dismissing the Berber story as fantasy myth, but for the following considerations. Stewart found that in ordinary everyday matters, these people spoke in the native Berber tongue, but when they spoke concerning religious and magical matters, they used a special secret language which made no sense to the ordinary Berbers. Later, when Stuart liaised with Long, he noted an extraordinary similarity between the secret language spoken by the Berbers 
and the secret tongue of the kahunas. Here were two primitive peoples, separated by thousands of miles of land and sea, who were found to be speaking an almost identical tongue concerning the one matter most precious to them both, magic. Now consider further. The Hawaiian peoples themselves have a folk legend that says their distant ancestors came from a far-off land, and they left this far-off land via the Red Sea of Cain. The Red Sea of Cain is none other than the Egyptian Red Sea. There is only one stretch of water in the whole world called the Red Sea, called such in about a dozen different tongues, and that is the one situated east of Egypt. And note this. In the Polynesian islands today, the natives consist of eleven different tribes. Kahuna evidence worldwide. Can such matters be mere coincidence? The possibility of coincidence grows considerably less when one sees from a close study of Polynesian customs and traditions that they are almost all of Indian origin. Polynesian words and expressions can be found in many different languages and cultures from India all the way out to the northern Pacific to where the Hawaiian Islands are located. The Berber legend says that their ancestors went east via India. It is more than likely that they spent some time sojourning in India and other lands as a part of their long trip eastwards. There is a definite, undeniable similarity of beliefs between the ancient Hindus and the Kahunas. For proof consult the amazing evidence in Max Freedom Long's important work, The Huna Code in Religions. In the early 1900s, when the Berber legend was disclosed to Stuart, the notion that the Sahara was once green and fertile would have seemed absurd. But science has since proved the Berbers right. There is now definite geological evidence that the Sahara, today a bleak and inclement landscape of limitless sand and desert, once flowed with many rich rivers. The geologists say that this was millions of years ago. It may not have been so long. Scientific dating assumptions have been found to be notoriously unreliable. Clearly, the Berber legend has some historical basis. Anthropologists' View of the Polynesians As could be expected, the anthropologists have a very different idea as to the origin of the Polynesians. Scientists, true to form, can never admit to anything that seems unusual, mystical, or bizarre. Everything must have a dry, rational explanation, no matter how little evidence there is to support their suppositions. The anthropologists point out that the Polynesians are a primitive race, not possessing a written language and having only the beginning of weaving skills. They claim that the Polynesians were once a small fishing tribe living on the southern coast of China. They were not able to defend themselves against the stronger tribes from inland, and so were driven out into the sea. We wouldn't dispute the notion that the Polynesians once lived in southern China. If anything, this theory helps to confirm the view that the Polynesians came from a westward direction. The anthropologists, however, overlooked the one very important point of how they got from China to Hawaii. They did not have navigational skills, skills which were not discovered or developed until thousands of years later. So how did they travel the vast distance of 4,000 miles from China to Hawaii without sophisticated marinal skills. The Berbers said that their ancestors were psychically led to the promised land in the midst of the Pacific Ocean. Of course, the anthropologists could never accept that explanation. And how could such a primitive people ever know in the first place that they were sailing to a place thousands of miles into the ocean that even existed? No one knew that the Hawaiian Islands existed. No one had ever lived on them. They were thousands of miles away from anywhere, and yet the Polynesians knew in advance of their existence. Note that when we speak of these Polynesians, we are in referring to the Kahunas that were their leaders. The Polynesians, although a very charming people, are a primitive race, and if it were not for the Kahunas, they would most certainly have never reached Hawaii. Kahunas New Bible Stories Another remarkable dimension of the Kahuna riddle was their knowledge of the stories in the Old Testament of the Bible. They were well acquainted with the biblical accounts of the creation, the flood, Jonah and the whale, and other tales from the Old Testament. However, they knew nothing of the New Testament, which automatically canceled out any theories that they gained their biblical knowledge from the early Christian missionaries. 
It would be inconceivable to think that the missionaries would tell the kahunas about Noah and Moses, and say nothing of Christ, in whose name they were supposed to convert these people. Interestingly, there was never evidence of any kahuna going Christian. Apparently, they considered Christianity a weak and inconsistent belief, as its followers could not duplicate the miracles that its founder was alleged to have performed. They could see no point in changing to a religion that was, in their view, patently inferior to their own. The kahuna's knowledge of folklore that originated in the Middle East was again strongly suggestive that they once had a very definite connection with that area. Note too the very obvious biblical implications of the twelve tribes, the promised land, and the lost twelfth tribe that took a different direction to the other tribes. There are far too many coincidences in the Kahuna story for the matter to be taken casually. Max Freedom Long, who spent his entire adult life researching the Kahuna culture, was astonished by where his research led him. He certainly never expected to find the magical traditions of remote Hawaii to have such a definite connection with the magical traditions of old Egypt. He never expected to find kahuna ideas and concepts as a definite part of ancient Hindu philosophy, and most surprisingly of all to discover that much of the Old Testament of the Bible was written in a tongue remarkably akin to the secret language of the kahunas. The Huna Code To the reader who wishes to explore more fully the amazing background of the kahunas, we cannot recommend to highly Max Freedom Long's classic work, The Huna Code in Religions. It is a masterpiece of both scholarly research and mystical revelation. Its subject is Long's painstaking efforts to crack what he called the Huna Code, which he found as a major common denominator in all the major world religions. It is a book that will convince the searching reader that not only did the Kahunas possess the divine power to perform miracles, but they also possessed an incredible esoteric knowledge that has in effect formed the basis of man's magical beliefs for at least the last 3,000 years. A conclusion that can be drawn. The author doesn't claim that the Polynesians were the original Egyptians. That is no more correct than to say that the modern Egyptians were the original Egyptians. Today's Egyptian may have toiled on the banks of the Nile in the Old World, but he certainly had nothing to do with the magnificent knowledge and culture created by a very special breed of people in those far off days. The Kahunas, however, who were revered and feared by the ordinary Polynesian, did in fact have a very definite and obvious connection with the ancient wonder workers of Egypt. As up until recent times, the Kahunas were the magical elite of the Polynesians, so they could too have been amongst the magical elite of the Old World when they resided there. For Old Egypt, like all great civilizations, was controlled by a select few. In Old Egypt, it was the high priests who held the real power. A pharaoh out of tune with the high priests was a pharaoh with a very precarious rule indeed. The high priests held the keys of magical power, which is the most potent form of power any group of people could hold at any time, any place, any age. The carefully documented magical feats of the kahunas would certainly have given them the kind of bona fide qualifications that is associated with the wonder workers of ancient Egypt. A close comparison of kahuna beliefs with the beliefs of the ancient Egyptians wipes out all shadows of doubt completely. To this end, we again recommend Max Long's book, The Huna Code in Religions. Chapter 2 The Amazing Psychological System of the Ancients and What It Can Mean for You. The fabulous ancient kahunas were masters of psychology thousands of years before Freud came along. In fact, their system of psychology was more sophisticated, more advanced, and most important, more workable than anything thought up in modern times. Compared to Huna psychology, the modern methods are simply incomplete. It worked for the Kahunas, and it will work for you. Huna psychology makes modern methods look incomplete because they do not satisfactorily help people to solve problems or reach goals. It explains to people why they so often fail to reach their goals and why they fail to get results from following the instructions of occult self-help books. It explains why people, in spite of thinking positively and visualizing the attainment of their goals, still fail to achieve those goals. We shall now proceed to explain the wonderful psychology of Huna and show how it provides you with the key to understanding yourself and achieving your goals. The Three Selves of Man Huna Psychology teaches that there are three basic, fundamental dimensions of man. 
To put it another way, man is composed of three distinct selves, as opposed to just one as is generally believed. These are three separate psychic functions of man, all functioning as aspects of mind. This is not as crazy as it may seem, and as you read on you will see how it really very closely resembles much of what is taught in modern psychology today. What psychology today knows was known by the kahunas thousands of years ago. The Huna version of the Holy Trinity. So, in Huna psychology, there are the three selves in the one man. Christendom, and in particular the Catholic Church, thought that they had something special with the concept of the Holy Trinity, three gods in one. But this concept was really based on the old Huna idea which you are now learning about. Man is a holy trinity. We do not wish to demean the teachings of the Catholic Church or of any other, but we believe that it should be recognized that the ideas behind the story of Christ and the other stories and ideas that make up the Christian tradition were as old as the hills thousands of years before the appearance of Christ or any other of the biblical characters. The rites and ceremonies of some Christian churches, for example, are almost exact replicas of the ancient rites and ceremonies of the Babylonians and Egyptians thousands of years before the time of Christ. This great lack of mystical originality should not demean the power and meaning of the Christian rites for its followers. There is great power in the ceremonies of Christendom, but let no one kid themselves that Christendom has a monopoly on mystical thought and concept. Just about everything in the religious world today has been borrowed or modified from pagan beliefs and traditions that go back to the dawn of time. But the strange paradox is that anything that is obviously pagan, such as witchcraft, for example, is automatically condemned by Christendom as evil and satanical, when, in effect, Christendom owes its very existence to these evil and satanical forces. Locations of the Three Selves The three selves of Huna are the low self, the middle self, and the high self. They are so called because of their psychical locations. The low self is in that area of the body known as the solar plexus, the middle self is located in the left side of the head, and the high self is situated at about five feet above the head. The middle self. The middle self is our awake conscious mind. That part of us of which we are mostly aware and by which we reason, think, and make decisions. It is quite simply the conscious mind of modern psychology. The low self. The low self can best be equated to the Freudian concept of the subconscious or unconscious mind. It is, according to Huna, the seat of feeling and emotion. One reason that it is called the low self in Huna is that it can be commanded and instructed to do things by the middle self. Theoretically, the middle self makes the decisions, and the low self carries them out. In practice, this is not often the case, as we shall presently see. The low self, although of lesser importance in the Huna trilogy, performs an extremely vital role in the total function of the man. In spite of it being under the theoretical control of the middle self, it controls all day-to-day -day workings of the body quite independently of the middle self. It performs the million and one functions of every single cell of the body every second of the day, a task which would be completely beyond the powers of the middle self to perform. The middle self can be likened to the management of a firm, whilst the low self symbolizes the workers. The management, middle self, makes the decisions, whilst the workers, low self, follows them through. Low self is a computer. The low self can be likened to a computer, although it is infinitely more complex than anything that man could ever create. It performs millions of vital functions within the body and mind every split second. What the middle self feeds into the low self computer is automatically acted upon. Unfortunately, many people seem to be unaware of the existence of this computer mind that they possess and, as a consequence, carelessly feed into it all sorts of rubbish and then get a lot of rubbish back from it. If the middle self feeds its lower counterpart with strong, healthy thoughts, the result is a much better functioning body. Carelessly feed it with negative and unwholesome thoughts, and a weaker functioning of the body will be the result. The low self is not able to make rational decisions of its own. It is simply an automaton. The low self is an animal of reactions only. It feels things, but does not think them. The thinking goes on in the middle self, the feeling in the low self. 
Note how, when you feel nervous, the feeling seems to emanate from the stomach. The stomach is the area of the solar plexus, which, in Huna, is where the low self is located. There is more to meet the eye in the expression, I've got a gut feeling about this thing, than is generally realized. Low self is memory center. The low self is also the repository of all memory. All feelings ever experienced, either now or when you were two years old, are stored within the memory center of the low self. Also guilt complexes and neuroses, no matter how much they are repressed, remain very alive in the low self. The low self forgets nothing. Modern psychology, like the churches, prides itself on what it thinks it knows. Psychologists think that they are modern, enlightened, without time for mystical rubbish. And yet the mystics of the ancient world knew all about the conscious, middle self, and subconscious, low self, minds, thousands of years before the arrival of puffed-up self-important 20th century psychologists. The All-Powerful High Self Now we come to the third, and by far the most powerful, member of the trilogy. The High Self is the spiritual part of man, being the most enlightened part of his nature. It is located at about five feet above the body, and is connected to the right side of the head by means of a silver cord. Research in recent times has shown that intuitive feelings seem to originate in the right side of the head. Occultists are also convinced that extrasensory powers originate from this area. The high self is both a part of us and apart from us. It is the guardian angel spoken about in Christendom. The kahunas called it the great parent being both a spiritual mother and a spiritual father. In praying the kahunas address their supplications to their high selves rather than to some remote great god. This gave them a clear psychological advantage over their contemporaries for getting results from prayer and magical invocation. The kahunas were practical in their beliefs. Trying to comprehend an ultimate deity was a psychological impossibility in their eyes, creating an undesirable mental and emotional blockage within the petitioner. They believed in a multiplicity of many gods, each deity controlling its own designated area of rule. The idea of one supreme god who did nothing else but listen simultaneously to the millions of prayers being offered to him all over the world, 24 hours a day to them, seemed ludicrous. They recognized the universe as an exceedingly complex place, beyond mortal reasoning. As it appeared tremendously complex on a physical level, they felt that on an invisible level, it must be as equally complex, if not more so. The God Within Mystical teachings throughout the ages have taught that God can only be reached through an inner illumination. God is not without, in the heavens or anywhere else, but within it has been taught. Such teachings have been confirmed in the light of modern mystical experience. The basic kernel and message of mystical thought is that every man is potentially a God in his own right. It is in effect the very reason for his existence, countless incarnations on this earth being called for, in order to achieve this ultimate of all goals. True prayer, or meditation, is a communication with ourselves. The Father to whom we pray is in fact that part of us which has already reached God's status, the High Self of the Kahunas. It is the High Self to which we must turn in order to gain eventual total God status. Once we realize our God potentiality, we gain the divine power to create and to destroy. This was the secret of the Kahunas' success, a secret which will soon be yours to gain a great new life of power and accomplishment. Technically, it will be noted that the Huna location for the God Self differs from the usual esoteric teachings in that it places this God outside of the body rather than within. But this is no real conflict of thought. The God Self concept remains the same, only the location differs. Moreover, the esoteric description of the God within is probably more symbolical than geographical in its implication. The Marvel of Your High Self To know that there is a greater, more perfect and very powerful part of ourselves to whom we can turn to and trust is indeed a great source of comfort and inspiration. No more does one have to struggle with trying to reach a remote great God in the heavens in whom we can never be really sure is there, or would be bothered to stop running the universe in order to come and listen to our petty problem. The high self that is so close to us actually longs to help us through our difficulties. 
and it has the power to solve them in a very definite manner, if only we would seek its help. For the individual high self is connected to all the other high selves of this planet, including the high selves that control the group souls of animals. This connection enables the individual high self to seek the cooperation of other high selves, providing, of course, that the cooperation sought does not conflict with the interests of the other high selves concerned. The High Self Paradox It is a curious fact, but the high self will never intervene in one's affairs unless its help is specifically asked for. Even though it will weep for you in your troubles, as it is with you in everything, it will not step in to help. This peculiar paradox of Huna psychology has never been explained, although no doubt if all the old knowledge of the Kahunas had been saved, an answer may have been found. High Self Will Achieve Your Dreams Learn to communicate with your High Self and a new life of unlimited happiness, love and accomplishment can be yours. Communication with the High Self is the cornerstone of Huna philosophy. Successful contact with the High Self was the secret of the Kahuna's success in magic. For to communicate with one's High Self is to be in tune with our own personal God. The High Self is infallible, all-powerful, and holds the keys to our destiny. It is an integral part of you. It cannot be taken from you. It is with you always, and is that part of you which will survive into eternity. Up until now you have not sought its active help, for you probably have not been aware of its existence. Seek its help and nothing will be denied to you. For it can influence any person, no matter how important or group of persons, to fulfill your legitimate wishes. It is a power of incalculable worth and magnitude. In applying its power you will possess the ultimate occult tool. The potent occult secret coveted by the magicians of ancient Egypt is now about to be yours. It is your key to performing miracles and taking a giant step towards godhood. Chapter 3. Pranic Energy – Golden Key to the Attainment of Your Fondest Dreams In the preceding chapter we learned about the Huna Trilogy of the Three Selves. We saw how the High Self is that member of the Trilogy that holds the answers to our problems. However, we must not overlook the importance also of the middle and low selves. The three are dependent on one another for their existence for as long as they are incarnated in a physical body. The Universal Life Force We are surrounded by a force without which we would be lost. Called the Universal Life Force by some and Vital Force by others, it is that simple universal commodity that we take so very much for granted, air. Deny us air for a few minutes, and we would die. Air, and the ability to breathe it, is upon what our entire physical existence depends. All life and nourishment is maintained through this most vital of all resources. It is a basic tenet of occult belief that this universal life force is charged with electrical energy that, when charged by a certain means upon entering the body, can be utilized to create greater physical and spiritual power. The Hindus called this electrical energy prana. Prana means breath or to breathe. The kahunas used the word mana, which is, significantly, also a Hindu word. However, in Hindu, mana means to think and not to breathe. As most of modern occult teaching is based on Hindu terminology, we feel that it is more appropriate to use the term prana in this book rather than mana to avoid confusion of meanings. The Magic Power of Prana The kahunas recognize the vital importance of pranic energy in performing occult work. They also recognized it as the staff of life, the very essence of life itself. For this reason and because of its preciousness, the kahunas believed in frequently offering a surplus of pranic energy to the god of one's being, the high self. It was, in effect, a sacrificial offering. This is the true, hidden meaning of the concept of offering sacrifices to the gods. Man, typically, has perverted this idea by sacrificing his best crops, slaughtering animals, and even butchering his own kind in order to please the gods. No wonder such gods were cruel and demanding taskmasters, for they were but only mirrors of the crude thought forms that created them. In Huna, however, the act of giving surplus prana to the high self is considered to be more of a love offering rather than as a sacrifice. 
a gesture of love from the lower selves to the high self who loves them more than they could ever reciprocate. The high self is the selfless love factor of man. God is love, makes perfect sense within this Huna context. Deep breaths create surplus prana. To gain a surcharge of prana in order to make a love offering to the high self, one simply takes a few deep breaths. The exact manner employed will shortly be explained. This prana, breathed in by the conscious middle self, is then converted into a higher voltage of electricity by the low self, which then sends it up to the high self. The middle self takes in the prana, the low self converts it, and the high self uses it. Pranic Transformation Here comes the most important part. The prana is the substance with which the high self works when we want it to accomplish some objective for us. Prana, once it has been converted into a higher frequency of power by the low self and sent to the high self, is the force that creates miracles. Once it is in a highly charged state and directed by the high self, it can smash atoms and cause dematerialization and dematerialization of matter. It is through this agency that the kahunas perform their extraordinary works. The Aka Chord A word about how the low self sends the transformed prana surplus to the high self. The low and high selves are connected by means of an invisible cord, which the kahun is called Aka. This cord extends from the solar plexus, where the low self is situated, right through the body and up out of the head to the high self. It can be likened to a telephone line, where messages are passed from the low to the high self. Another Aka cord connects the middle self to the low self. Low self is the astral body. Although its seat of consciousness is in the solar plexus, the sphere of influence of the low self is very great indeed. Its body is identical to that of the physical body, although it cannot, of course, be seen. It is in effect a shadow of the physical body, and is the body referred to by theosophists as the etheric double. A better known name for it is the astral body. Although an integral part of the body, it can, at will, extend beyond the confines of its physical counterpart. Distance is no object to it, extensions of even thousands of miles having been reported. Hence the phenomena of what is known as astral traveling or out-of-the-body experiences. The etheric double or astral body is not difficult for the trained occultist to see for its Aka substance is of a very dense nature. Because of this density, and the fact that it is the worker of the system with very many important functions to perform, the etheric double low self needs more prana than the other selves. The high self, being pure spirit, needs very little prana, except when it is called upon to fulfill a need for the middle self. We shall in the next chapter get down to the practice of getting the help of the high self to achieve our goals and desires. Chapter 4. Pranic Energy Your Magic Passport to a Lifetime of Wealth, Riches and Prosperity The secret behind the opulent wealth and prosperity of the ancient Egyptians is now about to be yours. Never again will you want for money if you follow carefully the instructions for building the magic pranic energy that your high self will need to help you. But first let us examine the virtue of using spiritual powers for material ends. Some readers will react, why bring money into something so spiritual and special? Good question. But why not bring money into the subject? And what else figures so high in the priorities of most people in the struggle of modern life? How many people could not use more money? Money is essential. There is certainly nothing whatsoever wrong or immoral about using spiritual or occult powers for material ends. Why should there be? Man is as much a physical being as he is spiritual. Money is essential to the maintenance of a comfortable and enjoyable life in this modern world. The only thing wrong with money is the attitude many people have towards it. People simply do not understand or appreciate the value of money, especially in this day and age where universal prosperity is so much taken for granted. Money should be a servant to man, a servant whose duty should be to enrich man and enable him to enrich his fellow kint. Unfortunately, in reality the reverse happens to prevail with most people. They serve money and are ruled by it. Money and wealth are totally desirable providing you do not develop an obsession with these things. 
Money should be a means to pleasure, not misery. Your high self wants you to be rich. To desire more money in order to get more out of life is a wholly desirable and moral objective. Let no one try and convince you of otherwise. Such folks simply do not want to see you better off. You can do without their sour advice. Your high self will definitely respond to a call concerning wealth as it is only too willing to bring anything that will be of help and benefit to you. Your high self is with you in everything. It will never deny to you anything that you really deserve. Why people fail to get rich before outlining the exact steps to be taken for building prana for the high self's needs? We feel it is in order at this juncture to digress for a moment to the important topic of why so many people fail to achieve their monetary desires. It is vital that you thoroughly understand what is to follow, because it could make all the difference between success and failure in your own endeavor. Many people, fueled with zest after reading Think Yourself Rich type of books, start pumping themselves up with positive thinking and visualizing themselves as rich. And yet nothing seems to happen. Some enjoy a small measure of financial success, but it usually just fizzles out. The fact is that they usually end up as poor as they started out, disillusioned and cynical. So what is it exactly that goes wrong? Are these folks simply not following the book's instructions correctly, not really being able to think positively, etc.? Or could it be that the books themselves are just cons? The latter cannot be because the authors of such books have usually made their fortunes before they ever wrote their books. Prosperity authors like Napoleon Hill W. Clement Stone, Catherine Ponder, Joseph Murphy, all made their fortunes before they ever wrote a book. No one can just walk into a publisher's office with the manuscript for a prosperity book without first having the proper qualifications for having written such a book. The publisher has his reputation to protect. He cannot risk publishing a prosperity book that has been written by a person ill-qualified to write on the subject. If word gets out that the author himself is far from prosperous, the publisher is faced with an acutely embarrassing situation, and sales of the book will begin to fall immediately. No, prosperity books are genuine all right. Folk like to say that they are cons for it, then lets them off the hook for failing. Some people just cannot put the blame where it belongs. But neither are such people stupid. They probably did follow the author's instructions correctly doing all the visualizing and thinking positively that was necessary and yet they got no results. So, what could be wrong? The wrong can be found in Huna psychology. The right can be found there too. Cause of failure. We have seen how the low self is connected to the high self by means of an Akka cord, which can be likened to a telephone line between the two selves. Symbolically, this cord equates to the light of traditional esoteric teaching. The communication that passes along this cord is likened to the path of esoteric thought. The secret of getting successful results lies in the uninterrupted flow of pranic energy between the low self and the high self. The communication channel, the Akka cord, must be open at all times for the vital prana to flow when required. Now, unfortunately, for a great too many people this channel, or cord, is almost always closed. It is in fact blocked, blocked for many years by negative emotions of guilt and similar complexities. To add to the blockage problem is the fact that many people are not even aware that such a problem exists. They claim resolutely that they have no complexes or guilt feelings of any kind. They simply do not want to know the truth. Guilt feelings repressed. But magic does work. Witchcraft works. Positive thinking and visualization work. So why, for so many, do these things not work? Like it or not, the people who fail are victims of deep emotional conflicts that often as not are buried deep within the subconscious mind. The conflicts are too painful or uncomfortable for the conscious mind to face, and hence they are repressed whenever they surface to consciousness. Unless these folk begin face facing up to themselves and the unpleasant realities lurking in their minds, they will never experience definite or lasting success in any aspect of positive mind power application. They might possibly gain success in black magic, which thrives on negative emotions, but never will they succeed in the white arts. 
for to gain positive circumstances requires a free mind uncluttered by neurosis. So, if you have constantly failed to gain success by mind power means, then your path, the Ock Accord, is quite definitely blocked by a negative emotional cause. Magic is everywhere. Do not be tempted to take the easy way out by declaring magic to be a waste of time. Magic does work, and in a very definitive and spectacular way. If you think otherwise, then you are a fool and could, at some point in your life, be in very serious trouble. To dismiss magic as poppycock would be the height of folly. For magic is in operation everywhere. It works for many people even if it hasn't worked for you. And the problem is that some of these people are very successfully applying their magic for very evil and sinister ends. Knowledge and application of magic essential. One should learn to use magic, if for no other reason than to gain protection for yourself, your loved ones, and your property. At some point in your life, totally without your knowledge, you could be the target of a malicious psychic attack, a victim of black magic, and, because of your ignorance of the subject, you will have no way of defending yourself. And the consequences for such ignorance could be catastrophic. Can you really afford to be ignorant? Black magic is one of the vilest things in our midst today. Its practice is more widespread today than it has ever been. And it is being practiced by people whom you would never have thought had inclinations in this direction. Black magic is real. Many books have been written on the terrifying subject of black magic and Satanism. You should read them. They will shake you out of your complacency. Dennis Wheatley novels, for example, are not pure fantasy. They are based on hard, terrifying fact. Let us repeat. Black magic is real. It is not a materialization of deluded minds. The author should know. For two years she was the victim of an extraordinary run of bad luck. Only when she realized that she was in fact the target of a malicious psychic attack did she employ the Huna protection right later to be explained in this book. The Huna right solved the problem and saved her from possibly even more calamitous circumstances. Do not be deceived just because you think that there is no one that you know who practices the black arts. Even if someone you know is a black magician, do you really think that he or she is going to announce that fact to the whole wide world? Face up to the truth. So if for no other reason than gaining psychic protection for yourself and loved ones, you should have at least an elementary working knowledge of magic. The magic that you will learn in this book is not only extremely simple, but also extremely powerful, as you shall soon see. But first you must overcome the psychic attack you have afflicted on yourself, the negativity buried within your subconscious, for unless you face up to the reality of its existence, your efforts with magic will always be thwarted. The enemy is both within and without. Ignore it at your own peril. Deal with the enemy within and you will have it in your power to deal with the enemy without. Once your Akka cord is unblocked, and the vital pranic energy is allowed to flow unimpeded to your high self, nothing will ever be denied to you again. Inner harmony will result in outer harmony, and success in all your undertakings. We shall discuss the problem of dealing with blockages in the next chapter, but for now we will explain the exact procedure involved for working with your high self. Contacting your high self. It is essential that you perform the kahuna ritual in absolute privacy, and neither should anyone have any idea of what you are doing. You should be calm and relaxed. Relax for a few moments in a comfortable chair in order to calm your mind if necessary. Now stand, with your feet about 12 to 18 inches apart. Now completely and absolutely absorb your thoughts in the scientific and metaphysical fact that all the air around you, and which you breathe, is filled with vital life-giving and life-sustaining energy. Sense and feel this energy surrounding you. You may not be able to see it, but if it did not exist, you would be dead within seconds. Now take a slow, deep breath. Make sure that you fill your lungs with as much air as possible. Do so calmly. Breathe in via both your nose and your mouth, your mouth being open just a little. This way you inhale more air. As you breathe, feel aware, completely aware, of the vital prana substance that is entering your body. Mentally say, 
I am now receiving the power of life. I feel the vital prana flowing into me. When you have fully expanded your chest and your lungs are full of air, hold yourself for just a few seconds before exhaling. Feel that you are accumulating a surplus of wonderful, life-giving prana. Now slowly exhale. After exhaling, consciously absorb yourself again on all the wonderful, life-giving air and energy that surrounds you. After a few moments, take another slow, deep breath exactly as before. Four deep breaths in the same manner as the first one will accumulate the all-important surplus of pranic energy required to be offered to the high self. This surcharge of prana is now about to be converted into an intensely high frequency of energy by the low self for offering to the high self. As this offering should be the very best prana you can muster, your breathing should be near open windows. Your high self will not feel complimented to receive stale, second-hand air. Visualizing High Self-Contact After the four deep breaths, sit yourself in an upright chair. Now visualize yourself sitting or standing at a distance of about six foot in front of where you are seated. Now see a tremendous flow of white light surging up out of your solar plexus. See it as being fantastically bright and charged with thousands of volts of shattering electricity. See it zooming up out of the right side of your head like water gushing out of a fountain. You can think of your body as a fountain with water gushing out of your head. To the kahunas, water symbolized energy and life. Now see the bright, sharp electrical light, or gushing water if you prefer this symbolism, enlarging into a huge circle over your head. It widens to about four or five feet across and six foot in height. The supercharged prana is now being absorbed by your high self. Dynamic, magical contact is now being made. Now, at this moment, see the objective that you seek within the circle or ball of light. See it as real and as vividly as you possibly can. Now comes the crucial part. It is absolutely essential that you know exactly and quite definitely what your objective is. This may seem very obvious, but it is quite staggering just how so many people have no real clear idea of what they want. If, for example, your objective is a better paid job, then you must know exactly what kind of a job it is that you want. And you must know the kind of money you are likely to earn from same. All these things should be absolutely sharp and clear in your visualization. Also believe at the moment of visualization that the job is already and completely yours. Visualize, too, that you are already enjoying all the benefits and luxuries you will derive as a result of the better money you will earn from this job. Everything must be absolutely certain and definite in your visualization. There must not be the slightest shadow of doubt about anything. If you seek, say, a new car, you must know the exact model, style, and color of the car that you want. Do not be afraid to want an expensive car. It is just as easy for your high self to get an expensive car as it would be to get a cheap one. And you must believe, at the moment of your visualization, with all your heart and soul, that you already own this car that you want. Whatever it is, be it a new home, expensive clothes, luxuries, or what have you, you should always believe totally and completely that these things are already yours when you make contact with the high self. Visualize detail. Should you want a large sum of money, say 10,000 pounds, be sure that you know exactly what it is that you want this money for. Money of itself is useless. Your high self isn't going to bring you money just for the sake of you having it. You cannot make a fool out of your high self. You must want the money for a definite and constructive reason. It could be for the purpose of buying certain luxuries that will please and enrich your life, or it may be for a deposit on a house. Rather than actually visualize the money itself, you should visualize the things that you wish to buy with it. See them already in your possession in absolute, vivid detail. Miss nothing out. In the case of a house, see exactly the kind of house it is that you want. Semi-detached. Detached. The pathway to the house. Type of garage. Its general construction, design, and appearance. The number of rooms. Type of kitchen. Interior decor. Color of wallpaper. The garden the road and general locality. You must be absolutely definite and positive about the kind of house you want. 
willing your desire into existence. After visualizing for a few moments in absolute vivid detail the objective that you seek, you should now speak something similar to the following. Your tone of speech must be vitally definite, positive, and commanding. I command that name of objective will come to me now. I command with all the power of my being that will come to me now. It is mine now. As I will it, it is done. It is settled. You have exercised your God power. You have now just performed an extremely potent magical act. You have willed your goal into physical existence. You have invoked your divine power to create. You have spoken an object or set of circumstances into physical existence. Momentarily, you have become as God. The God of the Bible is shown as speaking things into existence. God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Thank your high self. Having willed the objective of your desire into existence, close your eyes and let your mind go blank for a few moments. Now say quietly, I thank thee, Father, for what thou hast done for me. Feel completely relaxed as you say this in the satisfied and certain knowledge that what you have willed is now yours and that your high self is now bringing it to you. In thanking the Father, high self, we can again draw an analogy with traditional Christian teaching. Christ performed miracles in the Father's name. Although he was God, he still thanked and sometimes pleaded with the Father. You too, in the trinity of your being, are as God. You can perform miracles, but only through the Father, i.e. your high self. Jesus could work only through the Father, and the same applies to you. Leave high self to the Job. Now, after thanking your high self, you should go back to your usual business and forget all about the objective you seek. This is important. You have handed the task of bringing your objective to the high self, so let it get on with the job. Your job is to get on with living your life. Do not worry or fret about the fulfillment of your goal. The future is safely in the hands of your all-wise, all-important parent high self. Evidence of High Self-Contact After completing this very simple but extremely important kahuna ritual, you will feel a nice sense of energy and euphoria. This will be evidence that contact with the high self was successful and that your goal will be fulfilled. You might also experience a slight tingling sensation. Some get this in the head and hands, whilst others feel it at the base of the spine or in the genitals. Still others do not get any tingling sensation at all. Whether you get it or not is of no importance, although it is important that you feel the euphoric lift mentioned above. If you feel no sense of upliftment, then contact was not made. Reread the instructions and make sure you understand everything. Then perform the ritual again. Time scale for goal fulfillment. How long, you may ask, will it take for the high self to make your dream come true? The answer to this depends on a number of factors. Fulfillment or materialization can come within days, as has been known, or may take several weeks. Fulfillment has been known to happen even within hours, although it must be pointed out that these cases are rare. The strength of the prana offered, vividness of the visualization, intensity of belief, all these things influence the speed and manner of the fulfillment. And of course, much depends on the nature of the objective sought. If you are someone of extremely modest means and you want 15,000 pounds, it is obviously going to take your high self some time to come up with a materialization. One other point. Your high self will not materialize your desire out of thin air. It will simply influence people and events by means of its universal contact with all other high selves, to open a way for you to achieve your objective. And you should be ready and alert for this opening or opportunity when it arrives. You will feel instinctively guided into taking the right course of action that will lead you, one way or another, to the fulfillment of your desire. Repeating the Ritual You should aim to perform the ritual every day until your goal is completely reached at least once a day, ideally twice, in order to attain a quick result. Do not despair if nothing has happened after a few weeks. Your high self will not let you down.
Trust in it completely. It will answer your dreams. Power of the Ancients now yours. You have now been given the basic kahuna ritual for making miracles happen in your life. The occult power of the ancients is now at your disposal to use wisely and with discretion. You will be astonished at the benefits you will experience, and as you grow more proficient in its use, the more quickly miracles will happen for you. We will now tell you of the true story of Leo Nodby, of Hounslow in Middlesex, taken from the author's file of case histories when she was a consulting psychologist and tarot reader in London some years ago. There will be several other cases from her file presented in this book, but she must stress that she is no longer available for professional consultation. She has been retired for some twelve years now and is very involved at present in the preparation of a several-volume study of Indian mythology. So please do not write to the publishers of this book asking for the author's services. She very much regrets that she cannot enter into correspondence or guidance with readers, but her time truly is very limited. Everything that is necessary for you to know about using the basic kahuna magic is explained in this book. Readers desiring further knowledge and understanding of kahuna magic are referred to the final chapter of this book, where several very excellent volumes on huna are recommended. How Kahuna Magic Prospered Leonod Leonod, age 23, was a dairy worker earning a wage leaving a lot to be desired. His passion was sports cars, but on his meager wage, the kind of fast and expensive model that was the machine of his dreams would be forever out of his reach. One day, by coincidence, he met an old friend whom he hadn't seen for a year or two. His friend was beaming from ear to ear, for a few days earlier he had won just under 5,000 pounds on the football pools. As both he and Leonard both shared an interest in matters concerning the power of the mind, he told Leonard that he believed his fortunate win was no mere stroke of luck, but the result of having performed the kahuna ritual for three weeks. The friend had been a client of the author's, and it was from her that he learned about the ritual. He told Leonard to contact the author to learn about Huna. A consultation was duly arranged, and the author explained briefly how the magic of the ancients could miraculously change his financial circumstances. For a month, Leonard faithfully performed the kahuna ritual twice a day before the miracle happened, a fantastic win of 27,000 pounds on the pools. Leonard had never done the pools before and only decided to do them following his friend's good fortune. With such a win, he could now take his pick of the cars he wanted, although he did consistently visualize a certain model that he was keen on. He could now buy two of those models if he so wished. Leonard's good fortune was to increase. He quit his low-paid job and invested his capital in starting a minicab business. After only three years, he owned a fleet of seven cars. Not bad going for an ex-dairy worker. You will note that for both men, financial good fortune came by means of handsome wins in the football pools. The high self sometimes takes this option in solving a financial problem. If both men did not do the pools, their high selves would no doubt have answered their problem in another, although perhaps less spectacular, manner. Have faith in your high self again. We would like to stress that under no circumstances should you fret and wonder about how your high self is going to solve your problem. It knows far more than you do. No matter how difficult the problem, your high self will lead you out of it. Learn to develop faith and trust in this great partner. It is faith that moves mountains. Have faith in your high self and it will move any mountain that exists in your life. Chapter 5. Gain Unlimited Love and Happiness Through the Magic Power of Pranic Energy Make no doubt about it. Love and happiness are your natural birthright. You do not have to endure loneliness or the emotional cruelty inflicted on you by others. You can have romance and fulfillment. You can win an admiring, caring love. You can have peace of mind. With the power of pranic energy, all the love, happiness, fulfillment, and peace of mind that you seek can and will be yours. Blockage Cause of Unhappiness If you have always felt neglected by others, or that life never seems to run smoothly for you, then the chances are that, in Huna terms, the path, or cord, to your high self has been, and probably still is, blocked blocked by inferiority feelings 
and perhaps other complexes buried deep within the recesses of the low self, your subconscious mind. As stated earlier, many people are not even aware, or do not wish to be aware, that such negative emotions can exist within them. So, then we have two problems. First, the problem of the buried emotional complex itself, and then the person's own refusal to believe that such a thing exists in the first place. People prefer deprivation. Many people, would you believe, deep down actually prefer to be lonely, neglected and mistreated. This seems a shocking, crazy thing to say, but it is a fact of psychology, which any psychoanalyst will confirm. In childhood they were deprived of love and security, and so they fed instead on negative, hostile emotions, which their subconscious, low self, accepted uncritically. The low self will accept any emotion fed into it. It is totally uncritical and without powers of reason or deduction. Years of such negativity conditions the low self to reject love and happiness because it only understands hatred, insecurity, loneliness. This is one reason why one may feel oneself feeling uncomfortable when things are going well. One recognizes that such discomfort is without reason, and try as one may, it is nigh impossible to fight this stupid feeling off. The discomfort emanates from your irrational, emotive low self, which will not accept the voice of reason of your middle self. The middle self represents reason and the low self emotion. When reason and emotion are in conflict, nine times out of ten, emotion wins. And predictably, because of the discomfort felt at receiving happiness, the happiness goes away to leave one lonely and miserable again. The inner blockage has repelled the happiness. Where there is inner conflict and lack of harmony between the three selves, all chances of happiness and fulfillment are nullified. Inner disharmony leads to outer disharmony. Where there is no happiness within, there can be no happiness or chance of getting it from without. The soul can be compared to a magnet. If it is in a harmonious condition with itself, and few souls are, it will magnetize towards itself harmonious conditions and circumstances. If the soul is in conflict, then harmonious circumstances are repelled. This is a definite and indisputable fact of psychology. It is metaphysical fact, an axiom of natural universal law. So, in order to usher happiness and fulfillment into your life, and all the things that make living worthwhile, you have got to achieve harmony within yourself. There is no use in offering prana to your high self when the path to it is blocked by so much negativity hanging around you. You will get nothing back from your high self no matter how hard you try. How to Combat Negativity The best, easiest and quickest way of eliminating inner discord is to feed the low self with strong, positive statements of love, harmony and union. Alternatively, you can go to a psychologist or psychoanalyst who will help you to try and find the source of conflict within your mind. But seeking help of this kind is extremely expensive. Your money would be better invested in buying some good practical psychology books, which will teach you will need to know. All you. Positive programming of low self feeding the low self with a consistent flow of positive, loving statements is, in the author's view, the most effective way to build a healthy set of emotions within the low self. This is not so easy in the early stages as the low self, being like a stubborn child, will not take kindly to positive programming when it has been fed on a deadly diet of negative thoughts and emotions for so many years. The low self is a creature of fixed habits. It hates change and will certainly not like such a drastic change of attitude from negative to positive on the part of the middle self. But persevere and resistance from the low self will gradually diminish. Methods of Programming And what is the best way of influencing the low self for positive gains? Self-suggestion and self-hypnosis immediately spring to mind as the most popular means of influencing the low self, and they are certainly very effective given enough time and patience. But one must choose the system that suits one the best. A study of the practical psychology books that are available will guide one through the various methods of self-improvement. A way of bypassing a short study of psychology is to use the method advocated by James Cullinan in his book, How to Change Yourself and Your Life, Without Willpower or Effort. The author does not agree with Mr. Cullinan that his method is so new or different. There is nothing new under the sun. 
but his approach to psychology is certainly direct and to the point. The author has studied and used his method and can say without reservation that it does live up to all the extraordinary claims that Mr. Cullinan makes for it. Mr. Cullinan concerns himself primarily with the subconscious mind, and his book offers some excellent instructions for programming the same with strong, healthy, and positive emotions. However, one suspects that not even his direct, psychologically excellent system can help everybody, as the psychological blockages in some people is so deeply rooted and a virtual impossibility to erase. But depending on the determination of the individual, nothing need be impossible, and with the right approach eradication of the cancerous emotions within can be satisfactorily attained. A good psychology book will set him on the right road, and James Cullinan's book could save him a lot of time in gaining practical progress. Kahuna Ritual The Kahuna Ritual for Ushering Love and Happiness into Your Life is the very same as the one described for gaining money and riches in the last chapter. In fact, you will find the ritual pretty much the same for all requirements, with occasional variations, which will be explained during the course of this book. Definiteness of Purpose Again, let it be stressed that you must be absolutely clear and concise in what it is that you want. There must be not the slightest doubt or hesitation in your mind. We will presume that your objective is a romantic one. You are a woman who very much seeks the attention and love of one particular male. When you come to the point of actually visualizing your goal during the ritual, you should have a definite, ready-made picture of your goal having already been attained. See him caring for you and being very much in love with you. See the two of you in all sorts of different places and situations together. Make the visualization of your love and togetherness as absolutely real and as lifelike as you possibly can. It is vital that you see him loving you. Don't just visualize him with you and not being in love with you. You want his love, and that is what you should aim for. Have confidence in your high self that it will make the miracle for you. If you have the faith, it will do the job. Ritual Outlined Here is a resume of the ritual. 1. Stand not far from an open window, with your feet about 12 to 18 inches apart. It is essential that you should be relaxed and without any nervous or anxious thoughts running through your head. You can calm yourself by having first sat comfortably in an armchair, letting your thoughts dwell on a pleasant, relaxing scene, such as a beautiful sunset or idyllic meadow. Once standing, let your thoughts dwell on all the life-giving air that surrounds you, air which is full of all the energy and nutrients that sustains all life, including your own. Dwell on the fact that the air is full of electricity, an electricity which you will soon absorb as pranic energy, and which your low self is going to convert into a supercharged frequency of incredible power for use by the high self in materializing your goal. Dwell completely on this fact. Give your entire attention to it. 2. Now take one slow, deep breath. Breathe through both your nose and mouth, with your mouth only slightly open. This way you will inhale the very maximum amount of air possible. You are now inhaling life-giving pranic energy. Fill your lungs as much as you can, expanding your chest, and be conscious of the fabulous pranic power that is now filling and enveloping you. Mentally say, I am now receiving the power of life. I am being filled with great pranic energy. This great power is now flowing through me. With your chest out and your lungs full of prana, hold yourself for a few seconds. Be completely conscious of the vital prana that you are now holding. Now slowly exhale and relax for a few moments. Think again about all the great surging life, power and vital electricity that is in the air around you. Now take another three slow, deep breaths in the very same manner as the first one, with again all your conscious attention focused on the fabulous surcharge of prana that is building up within you. 3. Now sit in an upright chair and visualize yourself sitting opposite at a distance of about six or so feet. It can be more, but not less. Now picture a tremendous flow of white light surging up out of your solar plexus through your body and out through the right side of your head. This is the pranic energy, which has now been converted by the low self into a mighty, searing high voltage force of power. Now, as this light shoots out of your head, 
see it widen into a circle or bowl at a width of about four or five feet and a height of around six feet. You are now making contact with the high self. Now, without hesitation, see within this circle of light the thing that you seek is being already accomplished. Believe that it is already yours. See it as most vividly as you can. Then say in a very definite and dynamic manner, full of conviction and belief, the following. I command that name of person sought is now mine. He is totally and completely in love with me now. As I will it he is mine. He is coming to me now. It is done. You can choose your own words to suit your particular situation, but they must be of the same very definite and commanding nature as the above. 4. Now close your eyes and feel totally and completely that your goal is already accomplished and that it is already on its way to you. Feel this and believe it completely. Now say quietly and reverently, I thank thee, Father, for accomplishing my will. You can, instead of saying, Father, say, Mother, if you prefer. The high self is both male and female. It is the great parental spirit of the kahunas being mother and father. This is in exact accordance with the father-mother teachings of the mystery schools. But whether you say father, mother, or mother and father is entirely up to you. It will not affect the outcome of the ritual. It is entirely a matter of personal preference. How Disillusioned Diana Found Real Love Diana G., from Harrow in Middlesex, was single in her early forties, not particularly attractive and had a weight problem to boot. She had given up hope of ever finding Mr. Wright, having become very disillusioned with men as a whole. She came to the author frustrated and without any sense of direction in her life. The author explained to her the simple magical ritual of the kahunas and advised her to use it with a definite, concrete image of the kind of man and life she wanted. Patiently, she performed the ritual every day for two months without any apparent result. Then Diana was asked by her sister Janet in Canterbury to come and look after their elderly mother as her sister and brother-in-law were going abroad on holiday for ten days. On one weekend, Diana decided to take her mother for a ride in the car. She is driving along a quiet country lane when a fault develops in the motor. She pulls into one side, stops, and gets out to see what's wrong. She opens the bonnet and tries with her very limited technical knowledge to figure out the nature of the problem. Before long, a car approaches its occupant, stopping to inquire if he could help. Diana explained to the stranger that she didn't know what was wrong and would be most grateful if he could help. Fortunately, the fault was only a minor one, and after a short time, the engine was working again. In gratitude, Diana asked the man if he would like drink and refreshment at her sister's home nearby. He accepted. Diana was particularly impressed by his manner and bearing, being quite different to most of the men she had known. He was considerably older than she, twenty years older in fact, and it transpired that he had recently been widowed. The age difference didn't matter to her, she being more impressed by personal qualities and character. They met again and discovered that they had several mutual interests, and soon a close friendship developed, culminating in a serious romance. Six months later they married. One thing that Diana didn't know in the early stages of their relationship was the nature of Tom's financial status. This, in truth, didn't really interest her, although she could see that he was obviously a man of some affluence. He had merely told her that he was involved in the manufacture of garden equipment. He later revealed, shortly before his proposal for marriage, that he was in fact the chairman of a leading national manufacturing firm of garden equipment and supplies. He didn't divulge this earlier for fear of thinking that her interest in him may have been purely motivated by his financial bearing. He was conscious of the twenty years' age difference and didn't feel terribly sure that a woman so much younger could be so interested in him for his own sake. He needed to feel that it was him alone that interested her. This she truly was, and a very happy and well-matched couple they transpired to be. Diana was so happy with this result from performing the kahuna ritual, especially as she was beginning to think that it would never work after two months of no apparent development, that she invited the author to the wedding. 
Subsequently, the author became good friends with Diana and Tom. To this day, the events described took place in 1967. The author still visits them, work and study permitting, at their lovely home just outside of Canterbury. How a Despairing Man Saved His Marriage Whilst Diana sought to win love, Peter W., an ambitious young architect from Luton in Bedfordshire, was anxious to win back love. He and his wife Anne had been happily married for several years and had two children. He provided his family with a good life, and Anne not having to bother with the chores of housework and cooking, having the employment of a full-time domestic helper, led a life of relative ease compared to that of most housewives. Anne was very fond of dancing and nightlife in general. Peter, working long hours at the office, was, understandably, less disposed to such activities. All he wanted to do on arriving home was to put his feet up and relax. Anne became restless. Unfortunately, Peter's long hours at the office were also beginning to exact their toll on their sex life, intimacy becoming more and more of a rarity between them. Then, one afternoon, out of the blue and old flame of Anne's turned up to see how she was getting on after so long. They chatted for about an hour, and the friend said that he might drop in again some time. A week later he called again. Anne liked this little diversion. She was bored, and the renewed attention of an old flame was flattering. She had always a soft spot for this. As these men, we shall call him Alan, in spite of the years that had passed since they had once courted each other, things go, he called a few more times, and soon a serious relationship was developing. Peter didn't begin to suspect anything until he began to find notes from Anne on his arrival home evenings to the effect that she was visiting an old girlfriend. Then Peter learned from his talkative children that they had seen a man with their mother one afternoon. They described the man as having a beard, a point of description that automatically stands out in any child's mind. He began to wonder if it could not be Alan the only person and old acquaintance he knew who possessed a beard, and who had been a boyfriend of Anne's before their marriage. Tactfully Peter spoke to Anne about the matter, and ascertained that it was indeed Alan that she had seen when the children were present. But she insisted that it was a girlfriend whom she had been visiting during recent evenings. To avoid a lot of unnecessary detail and explanation, we shall say that Peter did eventually discover that his wife was having an affair with another man, the other man being Alan as he had originally suspected. Peter, who had always loved Anne, in spite of the long hours and dedication to his job, was heartbroken by this discovery. His work began to suffer, he became despondent, and his moods became unpredictable and sometimes unpleasant. He feared losing Anne altogether, as it appeared to him that what was happening was no casual flirt between his wife and another man, but a fully-fledged serious love affair that was threatening to break up their marriage unless something was done pretty soon about it. Peter came to the author for a tarot consultancy in the hope of finding some good in the future. The cards showed that his marital situation looked bleak. The author explained that the future could be much brighter if he was prepared to believe in the power of kahuna magic and give it time to work. The author also censured him for helping to create the predicament in which he now finds himself in by having given too much time to his work and not enough to his wife. Believing he had nothing to lose, Peter went ahead and started practicing the kahuna ritual every day. After only four days, he noticed a startling change in his wife. The tension between them was immediately less, and she began to notice him again. Two days later, she declared her complete love for him and that things would be different in future. Peter apologized for having neglected her so and admitted that he was as much to blame as anybody for the gulf that had sprung up between them. Needless to say, she stopped seeing the other man. Peter began to get his priorities right, and soon he and Anne were spending much more time together than ever before, and it was as if they were falling in love with each other all over again, as they had done so many years earlier. Peter was astonished by this miracle answer to his problem achieved by pranic energy, and he consulted the author several more times for using this power to benefit him in other areas of his life. He later reported immense satisfaction with the results from the uses of kahuna magic for a variety of diverse purposes. Pranic energy didn't seem to work for Mark. Finally, in concluding this chapter, 
we will give you an example of a young man who went to his high self to fulfill a dream and did not get what he asked for. His high self gave him something much better instead. Mark, a chemistry student from Bournemouth, met Gloria at a sports club and was immediately smitten by her. Gloria seemed to have this effect on all young men, and some of the not-so-young too, as she possessed the most eye-catching figure any young woman could ever wish to have, a beautiful face and a bright and sparkling personality to match. Each time he saw her at the club his heart would leap. He saw that she was the center of attention and admiration of other much better-looking fellows, and he felt despair at not being able to get himself into her life in a very substantial way. She said hello and exchanged pleasantries with him, but he sensed that she wasn't really interested in him. To him this was torture. He had fallen hard for Gloria, and his studies began to suffer as a consequence. He poured his heart out to an aunt, a kint and understanding woman, who suggested that he should visit the author who had helped her through consultation on several occasions in the past. Mark arrived at the author's office feeling rather foolish and nervous, but soon began to relax when the tarot cards revealed to the author the nature of his problem, without him having to utter a word about it. He was advised that pranic energy was the answer for him, and that if he gave enough of it to his high self, then the high self would materialize his dream. Enthusiastically, Mark went home and began using the kahuna ritual right away. Three months passed, and an extremely disillusioned Mark returned to the author's office. He was upset that nothing had happened in spite of faithfully performing the ritual every day, two to three times each day. He was feeling worse than ever. Exams were shortly due, and he had given up any thought of ever passing them because of how his studies had suffered as a result of his obsession with Gloria. She was as elusive as ever, and he just couldn't get her out of his head. He had tried all sorts of tactics for trying to secure a date with her, but all to no avail. Yet he knew that she wasn't going steady with anyone in particular, and this added to his acute frustration. Pranic energy, he felt, was a con. He said it hadn't got him anywhere, and instead of helping him, he was simply worse off than he was in the beginning. To make sure that he was charging himself correctly with prana, and that he was making contact with his high self, the author asked him to do the ritual in her office exactly as he does at home, describing the nature of his visualization and thoughts as he is doing it. The author was satisfied that Mark was performing the ritual correctly and exactly as instructed. He was no fool. He had a good mind, a mind that could make him a good living in a good profession but which was now in jeopardy because of his all-consuming obsession with the glamour girl from the sports club. Mark had been performing the ritual, and clearly there had been no result whatsoever after a whole three months of patient trying. This left only one conclusion. His high self was actually protecting him from this girl. There had to be a reason, a very good reason why his high self was not responding. As explained previously, the high self knows all, sees all, and knows the future. It is also a guardian angel. In fact, it is the guardian angel spoken about in traditional religious thought. It can therefore protect us from impending calamity and even our own desires and wants. Reason Mark's high self was vetoing his desire. This news didn't please Mark at all. And what impetuous, love-besotted young man would be pleased to receive such advice? Mark, in his cynicism and disillusionment, felt that he was being palmed off with a phony excuse for the failure of the kahuna method to work for him. The author urged him to see sense, a tall task indeed, telling him that in due time his high self would reveal its reason for not helping him. Mark left, looking like he had lost a one hundred pounds and found a penny. The author even felt that she hadn't dare ask for her fee for the consultation in view of his mood but she insisted that he let her know how he got on as this case aroused her curiosity as to why he was getting no response. She knew intuitively that his high self was sparing him from this girl, or perhaps preparing him for something better. The high self never lets one down. It is our truest friend and has been with us since the dawn of our existence millions of years ago. It is that part of us that perpetually incarnates and puts us through those experiences, sometimes very cruel, so vital for our spiritual growth and advancement. Right now, Mark's high self was giving him a hard time, but only for his long-term good as we shall soon see. 
For some. An unexpected event. One evening, a few weeks later, Mark was in such a state of despair and unable to stand the four walls of his room, which now seemed to him like a prison. He decided to get out for a long walk by the sea in order to calm his fraught nerves. The sea, like it has for so many people, always had a calming effect on him. He walked for miles thinking about things, how to resolve his dilemma, and how, if ever, he could get Gloria out of his system if he was not to have her. He was walking along a particularly lonely stretch of the shore, when all of a sudden he heard a faint cry of, Help! He was not sure whether he imagined it or not until he heard the cry again a few seconds later. He strained his eyes and ears to figure out from where the cry was coming. He could see the vague outline of someone in the distance, struggling with the waves, trying to keep on the surface. Without stopping to think and being an excellent swimmer, he removed his clothes and immediately ran into the water and swam to reach the person who was obviously in such great distress. The victim of this calamity was a young woman who was clearly in a most distraught condition. Had Mark arrived a few minutes later, she would almost have certainly lost consciousness and drowned. He managed to get her ashore where he left her to lay whilst he ran to call the Coast Guard. Later, Mark accompanied her in an ambulance to the hospital, worrying about her condition like a mother hen worrying for its chicks. Next day he visited her in hospital, where the girl expressed her deepest gratitude for his heroism in saving her. April, her name, explained that she in fact went into the sea in order to commit suicide because her fiancé, whom she had loved dearly, had broken off their engagement. Whilst in the water she came to her senses realizing that suicide didn't solve anything and would only bring grief to her family and friends. To die for a love that obviously couldn't have meant very much to her fiancé suddenly made no sense to her whatsoever. But by this time she was in real difficulty and was in danger of dying whether she wanted to or not. Feeling concerned for her mark visited her again at the hospital and upon her discharge visited her at home where he was introduced to her parents. Mark's concern for April, who incidentally was far from being unattractive looking, soon gave away for affection, which in turn, led to love. His feelings were reciprocated. He had had girlfriends before, but none seemed as right for him as April turned out to be. He and April had many common interests, and temperamentally they suited each other very well. One interesting point, which caught the author's attention, was the fact that astrologically both April's sun and moon were in water signs, the sun in Pisces and moon in Cancer. It was no wonder that she had sought to end her life through water. Of course, these most unexpected events were just the answer for dealing with Mark's obsession with Gloria. Needless to say, as it is with all young hearts, Mark virtually forgot about Gloria overnight because of his passionate new interest. Only a new obsession can drive out an old one. Mark learns truth about Gloria. Interestingly, not long after, Mark met an ex-admirer of Gloria on the street. Mark had quit going to the sports club since April came along, so he had been out of touch with the news there. It transpired that for all her charm and attractiveness, she had been for some time carrying a harmful VD infection. Apparently, she had a tendency to promiscuity and managed to pick up the nasty infection during one of her little escapades. She wasn't going to let that stand in her way of having fun and continued to have relations with men in spite of the infection. Two of her victims apparently had to seek hospital treatment. A week or so later Mark read in the local paper that Gloria had been apprehended by the police for driving recklessly whilst under the influence of drink. Mark couldn't believe that such a girl as her, attractive, vivacious and personable, could turn out to be such an obviously selfish and careless person, being nothing better than a whore and an alcoholic combined. And to think that he had gone through several months of whining and pining for her. A few months later, a very different Mark came to the author's office. This time he came with April, a most charming and affable young lady, and it was a delight to behold the obvious great affection that radiated between them. Mark said he felt heelish about the way he had reacted when he last came, and realized now that his high self had indeed been protecting him and saving April as a wonderful gift in compensation for the agony over Gloria. Mark and April became regular visitors to the author's office and at the time the author ceased her professional services, in the summer of 1969, 
They had been married three years and had one beautiful bouncing little baby boy. Soul Intercommunion The story of Mark and April is a classic illustration of the intercommunion of high selves. Mark's high self did receive his call for love when he faithfully performed the kahuna ritual for those three agonizing months. Had his high self given him the wayward glamour girl, he would most certainly have deeply regretted it in the long run. Meantime, April's high self was reaching out to Mark's. The latter recognized that this was the true love that Mark needed. So Mark was guided to take that destined walk by the sea, and April influenced to take her drastic action in the same area. April, her high self decided, needed this distraughtful suicide attempt to bring her to her senses about the emptiness of her former great love. Mark, it was plain to see, needed a dramatic experience involving another girl in order to remove his fixation on the wayward Gloria. Karmic Destiny The coming together of April and Mark through such unusual circumstances was clearly a case of karmic destiny, old soul mates to be reunited, and a case of both parties being saved from the most foolish fates if their own immature lower selves had had their own ways. Once you learn to get in tune with your high self and learn to consciously commune with it through the simple kahuna method, you will be spared the agony of foolish mistakes that you would otherwise make without this spiritual guidance. Once tuned into your higher being, you will enjoy a life of fulfillment and enlightened experience. Chapter 6 The Magic Pranic Way to Radiant Health and Vitality One often hears the cry, Why is there so much illness in the world? Well, as any person of wisdom and insight will know, the cause of such universal suffering lies simply in the way that men and women think and live. In the way that they eat and what they eat, the way that they behave, and most important of all, in the way that they think. The kahunas were very much to the point in their diagnosis of man's health problems. They believed that they were all due to one basic factor, and that is man being out of harmony with his high self. Total health, like total fulfillment in any area of life, they believed came only from a complete harmony of purpose between the three selves of man. And this they believed for thousands of years before the advent of modern psychology, with its new and revolutionary ideas about emotionally induced illnesses. Kahuna's Concept Simple To understand the kahuna's approach to this matter, as in all other matters, is simple. Any conflict within man's psyche will manifest itself in man's physical appearance in due time and that is all there is to it. Hundreds, if not thousands of books have been written on the connection between psychology and health, and the message of them all boils down to the same thing, that a disturbance in the mind will soon manifest itself in the body. The low self, as we have seen, will accept uncritically any thought or idea that is given to it, providing that, as the art of suggestion proves, the thought is repeated many times. If the middle self feeds its lower counterpart with negative impressions over and over again, as happens over many years of bad programming with most people, then disorder and disunity in the body will be the eventual result. For the low self controls all the functions of the body, and if it is fed on negative emotions of anger, self-reproach, envy, malice, and the thousand and one other abominable things that go on in the human mind, it will fail to perform its many offices and functions correctly. The outcome is an impediment of the blood circulation, heartbeat becomes erratic, the digestive process is slowed down, bowel movements become difficult. All these things, and many more unnatural effects, will go to create painful and unpleasant illnesses and disorders of every possible description. The price of negative thought is a very heavy one indeed. Negative thought blocks the Akka cord to the high self. You just cannot make contact and have harmony with your high self whilst your heart is eaten up with negativity of every kind. Low Self Repository of Negative Emotion The low self has stored and nursed every piece of garbage, the ideal word for negative programming, that you have fed into it over all the years. Being the memory center of your little world, it has recorded and filed every single impression, even complete trivia, that has been received through your senses since the day you were born. And as the low self is exactly like a computer in its fantastic makeup for absorbing everything, it will give back to its programmer exactly what has been fed into it. And that's exactly what man-made computers do, of course. Except the computer of the low self 
is infinitely more complex and staggering to behold than even the most fabulous concoction used in today's highly sophisticated technology. People blame computers for going wrong and for causing chaos, but they are only producing that which was fed into them in the first place. We get chaos in the human body because of all the emotional garbage that has been fed into it over so many years, and likewise garbage is received from man-made computers because of all the erroneous information that is fed into them by the careless programmers. It is not the computers that are at fault, but the highly paid dimwits that are in charge of them. Whenever a firm tells you that a computer fault is the blame for your receiving a confused service, then you can bet your bottom dollar that there is a marvelous cover-up job going on to conceal a serious flaw in the firm's system. Inefficient firms are made up of inefficient people. The computers, if they were capable of running the show by themselves, would probably make a better job of it. Remember where the blame lies. Although your low self may be causing the ill health in your system, do not become like the inefficient firm who blames its computer for the trouble. It is you who are the culprit. You are only getting back what you have fed into your system for so long. You are simply paying the price for lousy, careless programming. The fact that you may not have been aware that you were harming yourself in this way does not exonerate you from blame. Don't look for excuses. Face up to yourself and your inadequacies. You will be a much better person for it. Redressing the Balance in order to redress the balance for all the negativity that has been mercilessly poured into your subconscious for all these years, and which is like a millstone around your neck, depriving you of happiness and success, you must begin immediately feeding your subconscious with strong and positive emotions all the time. This is your first step to regaining good health and enjoying success and happiness in life. How does one feed healthy emotions all the time to the low self? By watching your middle self very carefully. Every time your middle self thinks a negative thought, no matter how trivial, it gets fed immediately into the computer of the low self. You must be ruthlessly diligent and watchful about what you allow to enter into the sanctuary of your mind. This entails a total transformation of mental attitudes and habits. You have got to banish negative thinking right out of your life. Negative thinking is unhealthy thinking. You must strive to build a completely positive attitude towards everything, even towards your troubles and adversities. Instead of seeing problems as problems, see them as challenges. Instead of cursing your bad luck, learn to think deeply and constructively about the good that can come of it. There is always some good hidden in misfortune, no matter how unapparent. You can find it if you are prepared to look for it. And you will be surprised by how little you will have to look for it once you open your mind in this new, positive way. Your life will be immeasurably enriched by just this little exercise. There is no difficulty in all of this. The only difficulty lies in your own mind. The alternative to a new, positive approach. If you are reluctant to find good in bad, then that is your problem. You will remain stuck with health problems. The Kahuna method of healing will not do you much good for it depends for its success, as indeed do all healing methods, on your path to the high self being free to carry the healing pranic energy. But the choice is yours. The author is merely giving you the options based upon many years of practical experience in healing and psychological counseling. Many books and methods to help you. Simply switching off negative thoughts and switching on positive thoughts will pay you rich dividends of incalculable value. And there are a fantastic range of books and self-help methods available for you to choose to help make the inner transformation as painless as possible. Not all the methods advocated are good, but most will at least help you a little. The best method, in the author's view, is that advocated by James Cullinan in How to Change Yourself and Your Life, without willpower or effort, which was mentioned earlier. Whilst not in total agreement with everything, Mr. Cullinan says it can be quite categorically said that his method really works, and that is what really counts in the final analysis. In the matter of changing mental attitudes, his method is the easiest, fastest working, and most result-producing that you will find anywhere. The author has recommended his approach to several people, all of whom have been tremendously helped by same. 
it is particularly potent with dealing with self-confidence and inferiority problems. Another excellent book, although of a different nature, is Napoleon Hill's world-famous classic, Think and Grow Rich. Since its publication in the 1930s, this remarkable book has sold a whopping 10 million copies, making it one of the biggest-selling self-improvement books of all time. Its main theme is the direction of mental energies towards the making of a financial fortune, but running through it is a thread of priceless wisdom of a general kint for overall character improvement. It is a book that stops you from feeling sorry for yourself, goads you into action, gives a definite sense of direction and purpose. We first read it in 1946, and it helped us through a very difficult period that was being experienced at that time. This was some years before we discovered the joy and magic of pranic energy. We have read Dr. Hill's wonderful book many times since, and have never failed to be inspired and enriched by it. A famous inspirational author, the writer of many such books, was once asked, what book has motivated you the most? To which he replied, well, most folk would probably answer the Bible to that question. But for me, it has got to be, think and grow rich. That about sums it up. Think and Grow Rich is the self-motivational book that has everything. Pranic energy will solve any condition. So, as we have seen, our attitudes to life have a strong bearing on the bodily conditions that affect our system. Get your mental attitude right and your path unblocked. And the sky is the limit with pranic energy. Pranic energy is an automatic problem solver to all situations, no matter how difficult and unpleasant they may seem. Before we explain the Kahuna method for gaining perfect health and vitality through pranic energy, let us first tell you the true story of Shirley T. from Enfield in Middlesex, who not only overcame illness with pranic energy, but gained happiness and romance into the bargain. Shirley's Story Shirley was a 66-year-old widow. All her children had grown up and left home and were now rearing families of their own. Being young in spirit, she did not want to give up enjoying life to retreat into a dreary cabbage-like existence of being glued to the box and knitting clothes for her grandchildren. She liked mixing with people and enjoyed outdoor activities, but alas these things were being threatened by an encroaching and very painful rheumatic problem, which was afflicting her legs. Not being one to be beaten so easily, she was determined to get around this problem somehow. She was a great believer in the power of mind and felt that somehow, through this medium, she would find a way of overcoming the rheumatism. She believed that this was a problem to be solved, a challenge, and not a sentence of suffering imposed on her by some cruel hand of fate, precisely the kind of attitude that 99% of other people placed in her position would have taken. Hence, they remain ill and immobile to the end of their miserable days. Not only did she possess a strong urge to overcome her affliction, she was also very concerned about all the drugs being prescribed for her by her GP. Such drugs, she realized, eased the pain. But what were they doing to her body in the long term? She seriously thought, with some justification, that continued dependence on such drugs could only cause irreparable damage to her system in the long run and eventually actually increase the rheumatism by the lowering of the body's ability to resist the disease. Drugs, it is now well recognized and established as scientific fact, actually impair the body's natural healing processes. So Shirley felt determined to beat the problem on two counts. She felt some relief, but only temporarily, from using the power of visualization when she lay in bed at night, seeing herself as being perfectly well and being able to run and dance as when she was a young woman. She read about the benefits to be derived from the use of visualization in all the many mind power books that she used to read so avidly. Visualization is a marvelous tool for helping one out of any kind of difficulty, but when used as part of a pranic energy method, as she was soon to discover, it becomes not just a source of temporary help, but a mighty and powerful force for removing difficulty and illness altogether. One day while sitting in the local park admiring the wonderful new blossom of spring, a smartly dressed elderly lady came along and occupied the same bench she was sitting on. They began talking both marveling at the wonderful array of blossom coming forth everywhere in the small gardens before them. Their conversation moved from one subject to another, until the elderly lady remarked on how wonderful it was to be in such good health again after many years of a painful arthritic condition in her hand, which had made life a complete misery for her. 
Shirley was naturally very curious about how she came to be cured of such a painful condition, to which the lady replied that she had been helped by a lady in London who specializes in teaching about the power of mind over body, referring to the author. The lady gave the author's address to Shirley, and an appointment was arranged to discuss her health problems. The author explained to her the importance of mental attitude in healing physical ailments, a point which she acknowledged and understood very quickly. This was a refreshing experience for the author for most of her clients with health problems, just could not follow this point at all, and then blamed her when pranic energy failed to cure them. Such is human nature. The Kahuna system was explained to Shirley, and she returned home eager to try the new formula out. Totally Healed A month later a totally transformed Shirley wrote to the author. The rheumatic pains had lessened considerably within a week of her starting the ritual, and in just another two weeks, the ailment had left her completely. She was now able to participate in all the things that she wanted to do, and which had been so recently cruelly denied to her. We confessed a little surprise at such a remarkable healing result in so short a time, as most of the cases on the author's files showed that improvements in rheumatism, arthritis, and similar complaints usually took about a month to respond to the kahuna ritual. However, Shirley did very much believe in the power of mind. Her faith was strong, her attitude right, and so the healing result came easy and automatically for her. Shirley was not content to be simply well again. She wanted more fun and action in her life. And she wanted romance. She may have been at the age when most women have got past such notions, but not our Shirley. She was human, vital, warm, still had looks that could attract a man and she had much she could give to another human being who would like to share his life with her. The author wrote to her describing how to use the pranic formula for bringing romance into her life. Shirley got into action right away. After two weeks, she was introduced by a neighbor to a 52-year-old divorcee who had recently moved to the area. Shirley liked him immediately, and the feeling was mutual. Next day, they went out together. More dates quickly followed and within a month, would you believe, he asked her for her hand in matrimony. Shirley wasted no time in accepting, and the happy twosome were married in the local registry office six weeks later. The fourteen-year-old age gap didn't concern them at all. Bill, the happy bridegroom, explained that, if anything, Shirley could be fourteen years younger rather than older, for her outlook on life was so young and vital. Bill had two children by his former marriage, and three grandchildren. Happy Sparkling Shirley was an instant hit with them all, becoming both a mother and a grandmother to a brand new family in addition to her own. Why Shirley succeeded so quickly Shirley saw the opportunities inherent in the constructive application of mind power. She had been looking for a means of getting practical solutions from using mind power, and she saw the answer immediately in pranic energy. She used this power in a dynamic, constructive fashion, as described in this book, and received results quickly and to her complete satisfaction. Shirley possessed no special powers, but she did have belief and determination. These qualities you can develop too. Combine them with the magic power of pranic energy, and you will become an irresistible force in all things. The Kahuna Health Ritual we shall now give you the ritual that enabled Shirley to heal herself so dramatically, and which has also healed the stubborn health problems of so many other people. It will quite definitely rid you of your health problem once and for all, no matter how bad or incurable it may seem. You will get out of the ritual exactly what you put into it. The health ritual is a little longer than the usual ritual, although based on the same formula. First relax yourself in an armchair so as to calm your thoughts and free yourself of the stresses of the day. Pacify your mind with a nice restful scene from the countryside or the seaside. Now switch your thoughts to a beautiful mountainous landscape with a stream flowing through its midst. Now picture yourself at a distance of six or more feet in front of you. Seated and see this beautiful pure stream, symbolical of spiritual energy and light pouring down from your high self, flowing down into your head and through your body. Picture its beautiful, purifying energy as washing away all impurities and germs that are in your body. See all the pain that tortures you being washed away. Now see this vital, beautiful stream, 
with all your body's impurities flowing out through your feet, out of your house, and down the street and into the drainage system, gone forever. In addition to seeing all the body's germs and impurities being washed out, see the negative thoughts and feelings being washed out with them. Building Prana The water cleansing experience will refresh you and prepare you for the next part of the healing ritual. Stand in a relaxed posture with your feet about 12 to 18 inches apart. Take four deep breaths in the usual manner in order to build the prana necessary to be offered to your high self. Remember to inhale through both nose and mouth, the mouth being open just a little, in order to inhale the very maximum amount of prana possible. If, because of your affliction, you find yourself becoming dizzy from the deep breaths, breathe through the nose only and make the breaths less deep. In this case, take seven or eight breaths instead of the usual four, as you will need to take this amount in order to accumulate the same amount of prana that would normally be accumulated by the usual four deep breaths. And if you find it difficult or painful to breathe deeply while standing, then by all means sit. Better breathing is secured from standing, but if this leads to discomfort, then of course one's concentration is less, and the whole value of the ritual is correspondingly reduced. Making contact with the high self. Now, having made the deep breaths, see the prana surging up from your solar plexus and out through your head. See it forming into a huge circle or ball of light above your head, in the manner described previously. Within this circle of pure light, now see yourself as already and totally healed of your ailment. Now let this light travel down through your head and into your body. It is a disease-destroying light of incredibly high-charged spiritual energy. It will purify and heal you completely. See it going into every corner of your body, through your chest, stomach, arms, legs, everywhere. When the light reaches that part of you which is afflicted, let it dwell there for a few moments. See it destroying and disintegrating the ailment completely. Then let the healing light continue on down and see it pass out through your feet. Now say firmly and positively, I am now cleansed and purified of all negative matter. I am now totally whole, cleansed and made whole. I am whole. It is done. Thank you, O Divine Lord. Say the thank you with a real feeling of gratitude and joy. And so you should be grateful, for tremendous highly charged healing will have taken place in your body because of this extremely potent ritual. Immediate Improvement On completion of this simple ritual, you will feel immediately much better. You will feel cleansed, peaceful, and refreshed. The pain and discomfort will have subdued. Do not worry about a return of the symptoms. This is to be expected. A complete total healing may not come for weeks or even months. Do the ritual at least twice every day until all symptoms have permanently disappeared. What Max Freedom long called the secret science behind miracles, the fabulous mystical power of the kahunas, is now yours. Mechanics of Kahuna Healing What precisely happens in Kahuna Healing? Well, the exact mechanics of Kahuna magic have never been fully known, the matter always being one of speculation and reason deduction. However, what is known is that the high self performs the actual healing in the same way that it performs work for other purposes. The white light, visualized by the person performing the ritual, symbolizes, as we have seen, the magical prana that has been converted into an atom-smashing frequency by the low self. Let us take an example like the healing of a bone. The kahunas perform spectacular feats of healing in repairing bones, mending them within seconds of their breaking. As every occultist will know each part of the body has an exact invisible counterpart. An etheric double. When the physical bone breaks, its etheric counterpart remains uninjured. It cannot be impaired. In spite of physical breakage, it remains entirely intact. It is an untouchable master copy of its physical equivalent. Every single cell, nerve and tissue is miraculously reproduced from an invisible etheric master copy. The high self, in performing its miraculous work, changes the broken physical bone into an invisible etheric form. Rebuilding or duplicating from the etheric master copy, the bone is then restored to its former perfect condition. Healing Others with Kahuna Magic 
Anyone can be a healer, and with the Kahuna healing ritual, you can effectively treat someone on your first attempt. But please bear in mind that to achieve an effective healing, the person whom is to be healed must be in full accord with what you are doing, and he must recognize the importance of holding a positive attitude towards himself and towards life if he is to sustain a permanent cure and not just temporary relief. Here is what you do. 1. Take the usual deep breaths in order to accumulate prana. The prana, once charged by your low self and passed to the high self, will then be used to heal the other person. The patient should be standing. And again, we must stress that he should have faith and belief in what you are about to do in order to gain an effective healing. Any lack of faith on his part is going to correspondingly affect the amount of good you can do for him. Place your hands at a distance of about nine inches on each side of his head. Now starting from as near to the top of his head as you can reach, bring your hands down the whole length of his body, maintaining a nine inches distance from physical contact, as if you were outlining his body. As you do this, think to yourself that your hands are magnetized and that they are literally pulling the negative emotions out of him. Upon reaching down to his feet, return to the top of his head and repeat the process twice more. 2. Put one hand nine inches from patient's face and the other hand nine inches from the back of his head. Now beginning from as near top of the patient's head as you can reach, trace the outline of the body right down to the length of body to the feet, one hand going down the front and the other going down the back. Think to yourself that your hands are magnetized and feel them pulling the negativity out of his body. On reaching down to his feet, begin from the top again and repeat the process twice over. 3. Now shake the negative vibrations out of your hands. Shake them three times, saying as you do so, I am removing the negativity from my hands. Now go and rinse your hands in warm water, saying, My hands are now cleansed and pure again. Return to patient. 4. You will now need another charge of pranic energy. Take four deep breaths, inhaling all the prana that you can muster. Place palms of both hands at a distance of about nine inches over the top of patient's head. Use a chair to do this should it be necessary. Do not get patient to kneel. Now direct the pranic healing light to flow down from your high self into his body and say, in a dynamic, positive manner, I command thee, O holy flame of healing light to pour down into patient's name and restore him to a condition of perfect and complete wholeness. See the light going down through his head and flowing through his body. 5. With one hand facing the front of his face and the other facing the back of his head, pass your hands down the complete length of his body, again keeping your hands at a distance of about 9 inches from physical contact. At that part of the body where the patient is specifically afflicted, stop for a few moments and see the healing light totally disintegrating all the pain and discomfort therein. Perform just once. 6. Face patient. With hands facing the right and left sides of patient's head, pass your hands down both sides of body maintaining the usual 9 inches distance from physical contact. 7. The healing is now complete. All you must do now is to break the psychic healing cord between you and the patient. This is necessary to stop him from drawing more pranic energy from you, thereby draining your resources. Cross your hands one over the other and look at them and say, I now break the psychic healing cord with 27, patient's name. Now go and wash your hands again. The cord is now broken. This final step, for reasons of tact, should be performed out of the sight of the patient. Immediate healing effected. Following this treatment, the patient will feel immediately better. Depending on the patient's level of faith in what you were doing and the quality of your healing work, a total and complete instantaneous healing may take place. But this is the exception rather than the rule. The ritual has to be performed every day, twice daily, until symptoms completely disappear. Biblical parallel. Note the emphasis on removing negativity from the patient. One is reminded of the Bible story where Jesus performs a healing and then admonishes the healed person to go and sin no more. In spiritual terms, sin is simply to be out of harmony with your high self. And disharmony originates in negative thought. 
it is quite impossible to sin without thinking negatively. Christ was in effect saying, do not think negatively again, for he recognized that the person's disease was caused by negative thought. This the kahunas knew thousands of years before the appearance of Christ. The same healing ritual just described can also be used to heal someone at a distance, even someone living on the other side of the world. Distance is no object to the high self. If you could arrange to do the healing at certain times agreed with the patient, the two of you can link up at the appointed times for a most effective healing treatment. The healer visualizes the whole treatment, and the patient visualizes receiving same. The healer will, of course, generate pranic energy in the usual manner. The patient should stand at the time of healing and feel the treatment being carried out by the healer. Healing Animals Pet animals can also be healed by the kahuna method. Of course, there is no negative emotion in the usual sense of the term to be extracted from an animal, but one can still mentally see one's hands as magnets for removing the poisons that are afflicting the poor creature. And healing performed in a loving manner is readily appreciated by an animal who does not have to be told about being in tune. Animals have a very finely balanced intuitive mechanism that communicates to them in an instant the nature of the thoughts and feelings of humans. Here is what you do to effect a healing for your pet. 1. Take four deep breaths to accumulate prana. 2. Pass your hands over and around the animal's body at a distance of about six inches. See your hands magnetically pulling out the affliction. 3. Put your hands over and around animal's body again. Now see the healing light going into the animal and mentally say, do not say aloud. I command that, pet's name, will now be healed. Sacred healing light purify and heal this animal now. I command with all my power that this healing be absolute and complete now. As I will it, it is done. 4. Break the healing cord that has been established between you and the animal in the same way as for a human patient as explained earlier. Repeat the healing at least twice a day until a total cure has taken place. Any health problem can be treated. Just about every health problem there is can be successfully treated through the power of pranic energy, be it the simple common cold or a serious deadly condition like cancer. It all depends on the belief, power, and prana that you generate. The author has a total of 194 cases of remarkable healings on her kahuna file, Cases that include migraine, ulcers, deafness, broken bones, lumbago, gallstones, obesity, pneumonia, and a host of other health problems. Pranic energy works. Living habits. A few words about diet and general living habits. While strong thinking is the primary cause of disease, there can be no doubt that a faulty diet and even faultier living habits also play a share in creating ill health. Good living habits are conducive to a sound mind. A clean and wholesome diet of fresh, nourishing foods gives strength and vitality to the body. Good living habits imply regular hours of sleep, a considerable amount of time in exercise and general outdoor activity, regular bathing, no smoking, and so on. It implies a life of balance. One cannot expect to imbibe in dirty, unhealthy habits, lead irregular hours, eat junk foods, and retain a healthily functioning body. It simply does not work. Should you heal yourself of a bad health condition and then return to an unhealthy and unnatural way of living, then you are certainly tempting ill health again. Interestingly enough, it is usually the folk who are most negative in their attitudes who also follow the unhealthiest of lifestyles. Bad habits and negativity go together. To enjoy a life of good health, vitality, and freedom from pain and suffering, one must learn to think and live healthily. Your body cannot be shortchanged. Nature cannot be cheated. Chapter 7 How to Gain Psychic Protection and a Life Free of Evil Through the Mystic Power of Pranic Energy Black magic and psychic warfare exist. It is not mere fantasy or purely a product of Dennis Wheatley's books. Dennis Wheatley's books, as he himself would have testified, are based on fact. Evil forces are at work today in every area of life, 
trying to subvert man's attempts at finding harmony, peace, and reconciliation. Scores of books have been written about the realities of black magic. Mountains upon mountains of documented evidence testifies to its existence. Investigate the facts for yourself. In the great resurgence of interest in the occult that has accompanied the ushering in of the New Age black magic and the cults of Satan have enjoyed a boom not seen since possibly the last dark days of Atlantis. Mind Warfare The real struggle in the world today is for minds. Even the eerie science fiction stories of government agencies manipulating minds is now becoming a stark and frightening reality. In addition to the billions of rubles the Russians are spending on military defense and research, they are spending fabulous sums on research into the possibilities of mentally influencing people and things at a distance. The battle for the control of minds is now on. The time when world powers will employ specially trained psychics to influence the minds of their enemies' leaders is fast approaching. For all we know, it may already be taking place. Commercial Mind Influencing The struggle for minds is very much at work in the world of advertising and marketing. TV commercials are repeated with monotonous regularity in order to subtly hypnotize the viewer into buying the product or services offered. Supermarkets pump out sweets and soft background music in order to drowse the shopper. A relaxed shopper always buys more goods. Subtle psychic bombardment everywhere. Whilst the battle for minds is waged in the commercial world, and possibly between governments as well, psychic warfare is at its most rampant in the ordinary day-to-day -day lives of ordinary human beings. It manifests itself in thoughts of anger, jealousy, malice, and so on all being emanated unconsciously by people to one another. More sensitive people are acutely conscious of all this negativity floating in the air and often feel literally bombarded by it. Defining Black Magic Psychic warfare shouldn't just be a picture in your mind of a group of demented individuals standing around in a circle calling down Satan and his legions. It is far more subtle than that. A person who is jealous of you is in effect performing akin to black magic. One may laugh at this notion, but it is a definite metaphysical fact that negative thoughts about another is a form of black magic against that other person. The difference between the ritualistic black magician and the person who just thinks negatively is that the black magician consciously directs his negative emotions against whom he deliberately wishes harm, whilst the ordinary negative thinker is not at all aware of what possible harm his thoughts may cause to another. The consciously practicing black magician can achieve more harm because he knows what he is doing. The ordinary individual achieves far less harm, thankfully, because he doesn't know what he is doing. Black magic, to define it as simply as possible, is consciously directed hate. And terrible in its effect it can be, too, because hate is a tremendously powerful emotion. If you were the victim of consciously directed hatred, you could be in very real trouble indeed. And how can you be sure that you are not the target of such an attack right now? In the vast majority of cases, unconscious negative thoughts towards another person make little or no impact on the person because of the lack of force and direction behind them. However, if several people all harbor negative feelings towards a particular person, then that person could well feel ill effects because of the multiplicity of the thoughts, even though they are not consciously directed. For negative thoughts become living entities, formed of the astral substances of mind, and if they are multiplied by several, these entities gain more life and power, and could soon hang as a heavy cloud over the person whom they concern. Causes of Envy The only consolation about being poor, ugly and unintelligent is that you will never be the victim of negative psychic vibrations. But the more you have, be it either in intelligence, looks or money, the stronger are the chances, in fact it is inevitable, that you will be subject to envy by those who are patently inferior to you. And the more of an individual you are, in example, the kind of person who thinks for himself and refuses to be manipulated by others, the more, too, will you be the target of negative emotions. For people dislike individualists. They make them feel not sure of themselves. They upset the scheme of things. Friends. Do not kid yourself that, if you are anyone of some substance, that there is no one that harbors some unkind thoughts towards you. 
Do not kid yourself that you are surrounded by so-called friends who are supposed to be for you, for nothing could be further from the truth. One should not fear one's enemies, for they are not the real enemies. The real enemies are much closer home lurking behind the guise of friendship. If you could read what is in people's minds, especially in the minds of your so-called friends, you would be absolutely horrified. This is not to mean that one should be phobic about what people think about you. If you were to ask your friends about what they really feel about you, you would never get a truthful answer. You have to discern for yourself. To develop a phobia about anything is to set a mental trap for yourself. Keep your mind free. Let no one turn you into a suspicious introvert. Hypocrisy of Friends Do not let the gifts and good deeds of friends delude you into thinking that they are your friends. Few people ever give anything for nothing. Sometimes people even give gifts and perform good deeds in order to morally compensate for the bad thoughts that they have towards those concerned. They may feel guilty about the way that they feel toward you, so they try to appease their conscience by performing an act of kindness. And you think, how kind so-and-so is, what a true friend. Brother, if you only knew. Of course, genuine acts of kindness without ulterior motives are common. But genuine kindness is very tiny compared to the amount of phony kindness that is around. How can one know when someone is being genuinely kind as opposed to being superficially so? There is no straight answer to that. Much depends on your level of understanding of human nature. Other book cannot teach you that. This book, or any only your high self, if you have learned to be fully attuned to it, can help you on this score. High self is your truest friend. Remember that in the final analysis, only your high self can be your true friend. Real fleshy friends are exceedingly rare. If you can count two or three real friends during a lifetime, then you are fortunate indeed. Anybody who thinks that he has loads of friends is just living in cloud cuckoo land. Ill health can be caused by psychic evil. We saw in the last chapter how inner conflict causes outer conflict in the form of illness and disease. But ill health has also been known to have been caused by psychic attack. Unexplained accidents or nothing going right can also be taken as evidence of black magic attack in many cases. Psychic self-defense Much is being made today of learning self-defense in a world of thuggery and violence. Learn judo or karate and fear no man. But modern man is in greater need of psychic defense than he is of physical defense. Psychic attack is far deadlier than physical attack. At least you know you are being attacked when it is physically, but you have no way of knowing if an accident or injury was not the result of a vicious psychic attack against you. One can be even murdered psychically, and the whole world would think it was an accident or natural causes. The black magician doesn't have to worry about any evidence giving him away, as all the evidence is carefully hidden away in the dark recesses of his evil mind. Murder by black magic is the only true perfect murder. However, the black magician may escape detection by the police, but other forces will dole him out a penalty far worse than anything that could be administered from the old Bailey. In truth, the black magician punishes himself. He is, in effect, a masochist. A bit like the daredevil stuntman of films. The stuntman flirts with death and enjoys it. The black magician flirts with destiny and all the cards are stacked against him, although he thinks he knows a way of short-circuiting karmic forces. No one can escape destiny, least of all karma. But enough about the problem of being a black magician. You must spare him from this problem by ensuring that your defenses are strong enough to ward off even the fiercest of evil curses that may be sent your way. Build your defenses. It should be borne in mind that the chances of coming under fire from practicing black magicians is considerably less than the chances that you run from the accumulated bad thought forms generated by ordinary people that you know. Nevertheless, one should be protected against both possibilities. One shouldn't go through life-fearing satanic attack whilst completely overlooking the attack from jealous or ill-wishing acquaintances, which is much more likely to happen rather than the former. So we will now show you how to psychically take care of yourself and fear no man. 1. 
Take four deep breaths, accumulating pranic energy in the usual manner. Two. See the mightily charged prana going up out of your head and forming into a huge white circle, as explained in previous chapters. Visualize this circle as being a complete barrier to all negative vibrations. See yourself encased within this wonderful circle of light. See your entire body in a state of complete radiance, health, and wholeness. Picture yourself looking the very essence of health, happiness, and vitality. 3. Now say, I am totally protected at this moment and at every single moment throughout the day. I enjoy nothing but pure happiness, strength, and health. No evil can touch me. I am totally and utterly safe within this great circle of pure, protective light. I command total protection, happiness to be mine, now and always. As I will, it is done. Speak with all the force and power that you can muster. 4. Close your eyes. After a few seconds say, Thank you, O Divine Lord, for thine help and cooperation. You will now feel a wonderful uplift of spirit. You have now built a powerful psychic shield of armor around you, which will safeguard you night and day. Be sure to repeat every day in order to maintain life and force to this protection. You will then be permanently armored, safe and secure. But what do you do if you have reason to believe that you are already a target of a definite psychic attack? We shall give you special instructions for dealing with this problem. First, let's just define how to recognize that you are the victim of psychic attack. This is not hard to do. Psychic attack usually manifests itself by a series of bad circumstances and events, which are simply too much of a coincidence. Or you may find yourself acting in a manner contrary to your best interests. Someone may be mentally influencing you to do something you do not wish to do. You may find yourself being generally depressed for no special reason or your health is taking a turn for the worse for no apparent reason. Any of these conditions is strongly indicative of psychic attack. How Sheila M. Became victim of a vicious psychic attack. Let us tell you the story of Sheila M. From Chingford in northeast London, who became a psychic attack victim. Her story illustrates very well a typical case of psychic maliciousness. Sheila was an affable 21-year-old very much in love with her adoring boyfriend, Paul. She worked in the typing pool of a large shipping company where she became good friends with another girl, Jean. Their friendship was strong until Jean met Sheila's handsome boyfriend. Alas, Jean developed an instant crush on Paul, and every time she saw him with Sheila, her jealousy grew. Sheila began noticing cracks in her friendship with Jean and observed a moodiness in Jean's behavior which she hadn't seen before. Then, for no apparent reason, Sheila developed a mysterious fever, which confined her to bed for a week. Two weeks later, she slipped on the pavement and secured a very painful ankle bone fracture. And as if that wasn't enough, she began experiencing piercing headaches and bouts of dizziness. As a result, Sheila, usually so cheerful and affable, began to get depressed and moody, often snapping at Paul for no reason whatsoever. She had never behaved this way ever before and started to wonder what was going wrong with her. Her moods and depression began to strain her relationship with Paul. This worried her for fear he might want to end their relationship, for he was everything to her. A cousin of Sheila's, Sylvia, suggested the possibility that Sheila could be under some form of psychic attack. Sheila responded in the manner that most people would to this kind of suggestion, saying that the idea seemed ridiculous. She insisted that apart from the very absurd notion that anyone could psychically attack another, that she had no enemies. People who have enemies always say that. Sheila couldn't see why anybody would want to wish her harm. Gradually, Sheila's fractured ankle bone began to heal, and the headaches and dizziness were decreasing. Her disposition was improved, and she was getting back to her old, usual, cheerful self. Then, one night, whilst walking home with Paul, she slipped on the steps leading up to her home and sustained a fracture in her right shoulder bone. This caused her excruciating pain, and she was off work for five weeks. Now more depressed than ever, she began to wonder about what Sylvia had said about psychic attack. Perhaps all this bad luck isn't just coincidence. Perhaps someone is trying to harm me, she thought. 
but who this someone could be, she hadn't the foggiest idea. Sylvia suggested that she visit the author, and desperate for any way in which she could end her run of bad luck, she decided to take Sylvia's advice. Sheila, on coming to see the author, was a most distressed young lady. There she was in the full bloom of youth, and yet apprehensive and full of fear about every new day. And she was full of foreboding that Paul may get fed up with her, and turn to someone else, instead, who would be more fun to be with. The author felt that her cousin was right. Sheila was under psychic attack, a very serious attack, and unless something was done pretty quickly about it, she could end up in a very bad way. The author explained to her the realities of psychic attack, and that she must put aside her skepticism and follow the advice to be given. The kahuna method for dissolving psychic attack was explained to her, and she returned home determined to give it a try. Sheila's Biggest Blow However, all was not to be well with Sheila yet. The biggest blow was about to be unleashed. As she was on her way home, after seeing the author, she was riding on the bus, and whom should she see board the bus but Paul with her friend Jean. Fortunately, it was the rush hour, and the bus was very crowded, so they didn't see Sheila. This was the last straw. To top everything, she was now losing her boyfriend to her so-called best friend from the office. Sheila was mortified. She felt unable to perform the kahuna ritual for her composure was gone. She now started to suspect Jean as being the source of her bad luck, for she had presented herself as a friend whilst behind her back she was enticing Paul away from her. A few days passed, and Sheila felt in a better state to do the kahuna ritual. She performed every day three to four times without fail. She was determined to break this evil spell. She felt her confidence grow and could feel the power entering her every time she did the ritual. Two weeks passed, and to her astonishment, Jean was sacked from the firm having been caught in the act of pilfering the petty cash. Paul, who had been a little cool of late, began to warm up again to Sheila. Her general health improved, her disposition was brighter, and before long she was again leading a normal life without fevers, headaches, falls, and so on. Paul confessed that he had been seeing Jean, but that nothing had happened between them. He told her that Jean had said to him that she had been in love with him, from the word go, and that although Sheila was a nice girl, she could give him more happiness and pleasure than Sheila ever could. Jean said that she had been jealous of Sheila ever since they first met, and that it had grieved her that he was going with someone who could offer nowhere as much as she could. This convinced Sheila that Jean was indeed the source of all her trouble. Of course there was no way in which Sheila could prove that Jean was using witchcraft, but she had undeniably become the number one target of suspicion. Interestingly, a couple of months later, Sheila learned that Jean was still out of a job, very depressed and irritable, had taken to chain smoking and was now living with a boyfriend as she had been thrown out of her nice little three-roomed flat for being in arrears with her rent. Life generally seemed to be going pretty bad for her. We choose the word interestingly, because it appeared that Jean was now the very obvious victim of a string of negative circumstances. This suggested that she was indeed the culprit behind Sheila's misfortunes, because no sooner had Sheila started using the kahuna curse-dissolving ritual, Sheila's situation improved whilst Jean's deteriorated. This is often the case when a psychic attack is intercepted, the result being that the attack, having been released, must go somewhere. If it cannot get through to its target because the target is protected, then it returns exactly to where it came from. Poetic justice indeed. The Kahuna Curse Ritual Dissolving The psychic attack dissolving ritual that helped Sheila and can help you is as follows. One. Sit in an upright chair and imagine yourself sitting at a distance of about six or so feet in front of you. Now see a stream of beautiful, clear, cool water entering through the top of your head. Water is a symbol of purification and cleanliness. Think of the Christian baptismal rite using water for the washing away of sins. See this beautiful, clear water flowing down through your body cleansing away all the harm and negativity that is within your system. See this water also flowing at about three foot outside of your body in order to also ensure a thorough cleansing of your astral body, which although a perfect duplicate of your physical body, tends to extend outside of the physical counterpart. See all the evil and unpleasantness being thoroughly cleansed out by the water, 
seeing the water become dirty as it absorbs the evil, flow out through your feet, out of the house, and out onto the street down the drain. Now picture more clear, beautiful water coming down through your body replenishing and purifying you. Visualize it as strong as you can. This is a most pleasant and invigorating experience. 2. Take four deep pranic breaths. Feel the power building within you. See the mightily charged prana go up from your solar plexus and out through your head. Picture the pranic light widening into a huge circle over your head, full of great power and energy. Now see yourself encased within this circle, absolutely safe and secure. Now speak firmly and confidently. I am totally safe and secure within thy holy light. Nothing can harm or touch me from this moment on. I command that any negative thought forms that are left within me to leave me this instant. As I will it, it is done. Lower your head, close your eyes, say, Thank you, Lord, for thine protection. I thank thee with all my heart. Perform this ritual every day and continue to do so until you feel the negative influences leaving you completely and that all evil sent to you has been cancelled out. Permanent Psychic Self-Defense One of the surest ways of building a permanent defense against the vicious thought forms of others is to build a strong will and a strong mind. This will make you impregnable to the onslaught of negative thought forms. There are many fine books available explaining how to build a strong will and mind. One of the best is L. W. D. E. Lawrence's The Master Key, often referred to as the finest work available on mind training and with much justification, too. Another good strong will book is Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, mentioned earlier. Such books provide powerful motivation for stronger and more meaningful living, and the person who studies them and follow their instructions will be richly rewarded indeed. A weak, indecisive, vacillating mind is a prime target for all external negative influences. A strong, positive mind is a tough target indeed for even the most determined black magician. Fear and Black Magic Two of the greatest aids to the successful operation of black magic is ignorance and fear. Ignorance we dealt with earlier. People who are unaware of the realities of psychic attack, or who do not wish to be aware of them, are soft spots for evil forces. One cannot protect oneself from something one does not know about. England, before the war, was ignorant of the dangers building up in Europe making herself an extremely vulnerable target for when the Day of Reckoning came. Providence and the innate strength of the British people spared her a fate she otherwise would have richly deserved. The penalty for ignorance, or should we say deliberately self-induced ignorance, is always a heavy one, unless one is exceptionally lucky. But in life, it is not wise to depend on luck. At the other extreme is the danger of possessing a morbid fear of black magic. Fear is the food of evil forces. It is the greatest weapon in the armory of the person of evil intent. That is why the black arts still flourish so well in primitive lands. Primitive peoples have been conditioned through their cultures to fear demons, spirits, etc., and most of all to fear the men and women who have the power to summon these entities to carry out their purposes. A man has only to learn that the local witch doctor has put a death curse on him, and he will die solely through his fear of that curse. This is the power of suggestion at work. Tell a man who believes in the powers of evil forces that he is going to die and die, he surely will. It is his own mind that kills, not the mind of the person doing the evil magic. Of course, the primitive mind cannot apprehend this fact. Thousands of years of conditioning cannot be shaken off overnight. On the other hand, the witch doctor of primitive society has only to tell a sick person that he will be well again, and well that person will become. Again, it is his mind, his belief, that makes him well, not the powers of the witch doctor. Suggestion is a very powerful factor in the modus operandi of all magic. Develop a free mind. So learn to be free of such crippling negative thoughts. Do not help your enemy by fearing him. Build a strong will and mind, and you will be automatically protected by it against any evil force. Ignorance and fear will always be the greatest aids to the work of the black magician. The only way to deal with black magic is to face up to it. 
Look it in the eyes. Take positive action. Defend yourself. Your enemies will certainly think twice before they'll ever try anything on you again. Beware the con artist. The target of vicious psychic attack not only needs protecting against evil forces, but also needs protecting against those who claim to be able to remove the curse for him. We would like to caution the reader in the strongest terms possible about persons who will claim to remove a curse for a substantial fee. In the author's capacity as both a consulting psychologist and tarot reader, she has given advice many times for means and ways of combating psychic attack. Most of that advice has been reproduced in this book. The author believes that the defense can be carried out by the person under attack by himself and with satisfactory results. She has over 200 case histories on her files of people who were able to defend themselves very successfully with the Kahuna method that has been presented to you in this book. In a very few instances, for to be exact, has the author felt compelled to direct a client to the services of a highly skilled and reputable exorcist. These were cases of apparent demon possession where the unfortunate persons concerned were clearly unable to help themselves. However, there will always be persons who operate as palmists, tarot readers, mediums, or what have you, who will tell a client that he or she has special powers that will enable him to remove his client's affliction. These special powers can be invoked for a fee, usually a pretty hefty one, much depending on the apparent financial status of the client. However, these crooks, and crooks are what they are, are usually very careful about the way in which they present their fee. They will not say, I will remove the curse for 50 pounds. They are far more subtle and conniving than that, and by being so can usually wind up by fleecing a lot more than 50 pounds out of their client. How they work. The usual line followed by such a crook is that he waits first for the client, or sucker, as he or she is before his eyes, to pour his heart out about all the misfortune that has come his way recently. Often as not the client is not aware that such misfortune could be the result of psychic attack aimed at him. Our so-called consultant will be very quick to tell the client that he is indeed under a very serious psychic attack. He then proceeds to warn that unless this attack is stemmed, immediately, the direst consequences will follow. The client, now frightened out of his wits, remonstrates, but what can I do about it? Can you help me? The charlatan replies, sensing a nice piece of work in the offing, that the situation is extremely grave indeed, and that it is too late for his client to be able to do anything about it by himself. You need, our con man adds gravely, the assistance of someone who is trained in these matters. Only such a person can get you out of this mess. The charlatan is careful not to immediately present himself as the person to do the job. He has tact. He has to make himself appear genuine, even slightly detached. The client, predictably, quickly responds that he must have help. The client, poor man, is now more worried about his circumstances than before he came in for the consultation, because of the charlatan's declaration that he could be in real trouble if nothing is done quickly. Such self-styled occult consultants always compound their client's fears as a prelude to sucking the victim of his hard-earned cash. Now our con man replies, Well, I could help you, although I do not normally do this kind of work. Not half. It's his biggest money spinner, because of the great psychic pressure involved. Wow. Our cunning fox actually has the nerve to imply that he is now about to do a favor. All good con work, psychologically. Oh, I would be so grateful if you could help me, says the soon-to-be slaughtered lamb with a sigh of relief. What can I pay you for this work? Now comes the best part. Money for this kind of work. Oh no, I do not take I only wish to help humanity. What an angel. All I would like you to do is to pay for the candles, incenses, and wax that I shall need to use in order to help you. But of course, answers the lamb enthusiastically, how much will you need? Well, let me see. Our shark, with a close eye on the victim, now makes the calculation. I think it will come to around 27 pounds or 28 pounds, but I should be able to get a discount from the suppliers, so I think 25 pounds should cover it. Quite some candles and incense that comes to 25 pounds and with a discount. 
but our victim will not query this, as he is only too relieved to know that he is going to get help. He is told to come back in two days. Our victim returns, and the great helper of humanity looks very gray and sullen. I am very sorry to say, he says solemnly, that the problem is far worse than I expected. The spirits have shown me that you are in very great danger indeed. Satan is trying to claim you for his own, and his servants are doing everything in their power to make sure that he succeeds. Our gullible lamb is shocked, distraught. But what can such evil people want of me? Why are they trying to harm me? These people, comes the grave reply, are amongst your closest friends. The spirits have shown me that there are two of them doing this to you. Unfortunately, the spirits didn't show me which two it is. How very convenient. They are very jealous of you and your abilities, and being practitioners of the black arts, they want to take these things away from you. This is going to be a very tough problem to lick. But what can be done to get me out of this mess? Surely there must be a way, anxiously demands the victim. Well, there is a way. What a relief, my friend. But it is not easy. It wouldn't be. The spirits tell me that you must make a sacrifice. Here it comes. The spirits demand that you must make a real sacrifice before they will intervene on your behalf. What, in your view, would be a real sacrifice? This is a clever poser by our master conman. You see, he hasn't actually mentioned money. The client now exchanges thoughts with the consultant and asks him what could the spirits do and why do they require a sacrifice? Our clever con specialist, anticipating such questions, replies by blinding his victim with a lot of obscure metaphysical jargon, most of which a trained occultist would dismiss as rubbish. But our victim, being not too over-familiar with occult philosophy, is impressed. He cannot disprove what has been said. Obviously, thinks the victim, this man seems to know what he is talking about, and I should follow whatever advice he has to offer. The sacrifice. But a way of devising an appropriate sacrifice has yet to be worked out. A sacrifice, says our helper of humanity, must be something of tangible deprivation to the supplicant. It could be to offer the very best food you can buy during the next three months. Or the sacrifice of a favorite pet animal, a little bit of gruesome melodrama thrown in, and an option which he knows the client will not take, could satisfy the powers that be. Note money is very cleverly given as the last of several options. The con man, being the master psychologist, and masters of psychology these jokers truly are. It has to be handed to them, that he has got to make it appear that it is his client who chooses the money option, and not he. How much money? asks the victim. As much as you can afford, is the vague but psychologically very clever answer. This answer leaves the door wide open for any amount of money to be discussed. No peanuts for this joker. He then takes great pains to stress that whatever money is given will be used purely as a sacrificial offering to God. The consultant is to gain nothing from this. Remember, and please take that grin off your face, that he is solely interested in helping humanity. Not for him the filthy business of taking money for spiritual work. He assures the victim that after he performs all the very psychically demanding rituals necessary to remove the evil curse, all the money will be either burnt or destroyed in some other way. Con men are genuine seers. The characters who exploit the misfortunes of others in this cruel way are invariably genuine bona fide seers. They do have genuine occult powers. And this is the worrying thing about it all. They could be excellent tarot readers, crystal gazers, and what have you, but still be sharks in disguise. They are simply using their genuine powers for purely selfish ends, for which one day they will pay a terrible karmic price. There are also some crooks who have no occult powers whatsoever, who are total frauds, who just get by by bluffing their whole way through a reading. But these are relatively harmless. They are so blatantly transparent to anyone with a moderate amount of observation and common sense. No, the true danger lies in those who possess the real powers of seership. For they impress their clients with the accuracy of their readings, and so when they come to speaking about evil spells, put on their clients, that they know nothing about, then the clients are much more likely to take notice.
The moral to be learned. Do not go to anyone expecting them to get rid of a curse for you. You may end up with parting with a lot of money to someone who has no more interest in your well-being than the person who put the spell on you in the first place. Only you can rid yourself of a curse for the problem lies within you and not anyone else. The pranic energy way for breaking spells will work wonders for you if you would but have faith in it. Faith is the key to success in everything. And as an insurance against being the victim of psychic attack ever again, you should strive to strengthen your mind and willpower. There are many good books that will guide you in this direction now. W. De Lawrence's The Master Key, probably being the best as mentioned earlier. Be your own man. A strong mind is a mighty fortress against the evil thoughts of those around you. Become your own man. Think for yourself. Make your own decisions. Do not let yourself be influenced by others. Forget about pleasing others. They will never appreciate you for it anyway. Interests. Toughen your mind. Think about your own. Follow the advice contained in this chapter, and you will never be anybody's soft psychic touch again. Chapter 8. Magic Pranic Energy. Your key to a lifetime of endless good luck and fortune. Over thirty years of studying Huna, and a file of hundreds of true stories of how ordinary men and women have transformed their luck with pranic energy, has convinced the author that virtually anything can be accomplished through the magic powers of the ancient Kahuna rituals. The author has witnessed pains and illnesses vanish overnight, wealth gained almost immediately, difficult problems solved instantly, and many other wondrous things caused to happen by average men and women simply invoking this ancient power. Such amazing first-hand experience has also convinced the author that the simple use of pranic energy was a crucial part of the ancients' magical powers in performing the most miraculous feats of magic. Mind you, the author has never seen buildings constructed by thought alone, or men walking on burning red-hot coals without injury, or the weather instantly changed from rain to sunshine, and other mind-boggling acts said to have been accomplished by the ancients. But there is absolutely no doubt in her mind that such feats were performed and that such acts of high magic can be performed again. However, in frankness, it must be said that such feats as these are probably attained only by a very advanced application of pranic, energy way beyond the scope of the ordinary mortal. Besides, to approach the matter from a practical viewpoint, what man or woman, beset with the problems of trying to survive in a modern competitive world, is really interested in walking on hot coals, controlling wild animals, etc. Walking on red-hot coals may prove the power of mind over matter, but it doesn't pay the rent. That is why in this book we have turned our attention to using pranic energy for accomplishing the kind of objectives that are in the hearts and minds of the average reader. Readers who wish to proceed with more advanced uses of pranic energy should study the books to be recommended in the next chapter. It should also be noted that the complete system of ancient kahuna has never been rediscovered. Much of it is lost, known perhaps to some of the mystic recluses of the Himalayas, whose lips remain forever sealed concerning such secrets. But thank goodness that we do have the essence of their ancient system, plus their wonderful, illuminating psychology of the three selves. A new life awaits you. A new life of prosperity and endless good fortune will be yours if you will make daily use of pranic energy for the rest of your life. You will find it to be the greatest thing ever to happen to you. The author has certainly been wonderfully benefited from her constant daily use of pranic energy. In 1950, she was spared a dangerous surgical operation for a serious glandular disorder from which she completely recovered, all thanks to the miraculous power of pranic energy. In 1952, she started a fashion business in Cleveland, Ohio, in the USA, with next to no capital. Three years later, she sold out for the equivalent of 30,000 pounds, which in today's inflationary terms would possibly be three times that amount. Pranic energy gave her all the business luck she sought. In 1956, she completely healed, through pranic energy alone, her very ill husband, Frank, who was in the grips of an advanced stage of brain tumor. The doctors had given him a few months to live. They hadn't reckoned on the power of the mind to heal, even to heal a problem of so serious a nature as this one. Twenty-five years later, at the age of 76, Frank still leads a very active and vigorous life. 
In the early days, he was a skeptic about pranic energy, but is now one of its most ardent advocates. How Jim Transformed His Luck Through Pranic Energy The possibilities for pranic energy are endless. You name it, pranic energy can get it for you. We would now like to tell you the true story of Jim G., whom the author became acquainted with through the HUNA classes she used to give during her sojourn in New York City in the late 50s. Jim had always been interested in mind power, although he had never been able to derive much practical benefit from it. Unfortunately, Jim was out of a job, and his finances were getting extremely low. To complicate matters, his wife, Pearl, had been seriously ill for some time, suffering from some very painful stomach ulcers. Medical treatment was expensive, and he was fast running out of cash to pay for the treatment Pearl needed. The author told him that the same magic that the kahunas used to perform their stunning miracles could be used by him to solve his problems. The pranic energy method was explained to him, and being desperate, he set about using it immediately, performing the ritual five times a day. Six days later, he learned that his uncle in Kentucky had died. It was a merciful end, really as he had been in great pain and suffering for some time, and at 83 years of age, his body's power to endure had been fading fast. Two weeks later, Jim was flabbergasted to learn that he had been left $3,000 in cash by his late uncle, and that his uncle had made this decision only two days before he passed away. This was just two or three days after Jim had begun using the kahuna ritual. Now the end of Jim's financial problems was in sight. He thanked his high self for its miraculous help. More miracles happened for Jim. Jim's faith in pranic energy was now very strong. If it could solve his financial worries, why not his wife's health problems as well? The author told him that pranic energy would cure his wife, but success could not be guaranteed unless his wife's complete cooperation was secured, and that she was prepared to accept that unconsciously she had helped to create her present condition by careless negative thinking over the years. Jim had a bit of a job selling his wife this latter point, but she gradually came around to it. Jim used pranic energy on her night and day. After only one day, her pains began to ebb. What pills couldn't do over several months, pranic energy was able to do overnight. A week later, she felt enormously better and was able to do the housework and go shopping without pain. Another month passed, and hospital x-rays showed that the stomach ulcers had completely disappeared. Not a trace of them was left. To Jim, not to mention his wife, this was fantastic. Not just because he was elated to see beloved Pearl not in pain for the first time in ages, but that it hadn't cost him a penny. He still had the $3,000, and he hadn't had to spend a cent of it on doctor's fees. As Jim had come to learn to respect money the hard way, he grew up on a farm in Kentucky in the pre-war depression days. He wasn't going to squander it foolishly. He was still out of a job. He figured that the best thing that he could do with the money would be to invest it in a business. He had always dreamt of being independent and not having to depend on other people for a living. He had an idea. His son, Jeff, a 22-year-old telephone engineer, had been for a couple of years running a part-time mail-order business from his home. He was selling old close-out blues records, records that were no longer wanted by the record companies that pressed them, as demand for the same had dried up, and the companies simply wanted to dispose of them at almost any price. Jeff, a great blues music fan, made a little money from this small enterprise, but always felt that if only he had some capital, he could invest in a lot more records and increase sales turnover considerably. Jim had admired the business-like way in which his son ran his little record operation and recognized that with enough capital, Jeff could expand rapidly and be able to quit his daytime job. So Jim made Jeff a proposition. He would, as a start, put $500 into the business and see how this would help. He would take a share in the profits as well as play an active role in the business. The extra money worked wonders for the business. Jeff was able to buy up over 1,000 closeouts, place more advertising, and turnover went up threefold. Jim invested more, and soon Jeff was running the show full-time. This was many moons ago. As Jim was forever an avid student of mind power, he always maintained contact with the author and her husband. 
and when they met him recently in New York in April of this year, 1981, they saw a very different man to the one they knew twenty-odd years ago. He was still involved in his son's business, but now the financial director on a board of six members. His son's company now owned over 300 record shops right across the states, selling not only deleted blues records, but modern popular records as well. The mail order division of the company, from which the business had its birth in a dingy back room of his Bleecker Street apartment, was flourishing to the tune of an annual turnover of two and a half million dollars. Jim was now a millionaire, and his son a multimillionaire. And all this had its seed in a simple daily application of pranic energy. We found that Jim hadn't forgot this fact. He told us that he had used the Kahuna formula with great success many times over the years, and was in fact currently writing a book on the subject of Huna. The book, he told us, had already been accepted for publication by a leading U.S. publishing house, and should be out about the beginning of 1982. He has already written four books, marketing manuals for the records distribution industry, which have been well received. Had anyone told him in 1958 that he would one day be writing books, he just would never have believed them. He discovered his potential for writing books through a remarkable experience with his high self, too lengthy to relate here, but which will be explained in his new book on Huna. In addition to his keen interest in music, he had always wanted to write songs. Through pranic energy, he received the inspiration to write really catchy and commercial tunes, which were immediately accepted by a top company of New York music publishers. One of his songs actually made the national record sales charts via a well-known jazz singer about a year ago and netted him a very handsome royalty check. Make your life to order through the miracle of pranic energy. Pranic energy can achieve virtually anything for you, be it the inspiration for writing a hit song or gaining badly needed money or helping a sick person back to health. Good luck and good fortune can be made to order through the miracle of pranic energy. Jim's life would seem to have been made to order because of all the good fortune that has come his way. But he was wise. He has used pranic energy constantly without fail since those desperate early days when his wife was so ill. He has become so attuned to his great partner in life, his high self, that he can tune into it automatically and instantly any time he seeks its guidance and help in any matter. Practice pranic energy and you will gain the same attunement. Knowing what you want. The secret in getting complete and permanent cooperation from your high self is to know exactly what you want at all times. Be absolutely precise in all your desires. If you want money, know exactly how much of it you want. Don't just say to your high self that you want lots of money. Say that you want 500 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds or 100,000 pounds, whatever it is that you need. If you are totally broke and you want 100,000 pounds, you are being stupid and unrealistic. The only way you'll ever get that kint of money is through a one in a million chance win on the pools. But you are simply insulting your high self for asking it for that kint of money in the first place. The kahunas may have been able to accomplish the most stunning feats of magic in the days of old, but remember you are not a kahuna. Given enough time, you may be able to duplicate some of their extraordinary feats, but you will not be making a good start by asking your high self for idiotic things. If you are, say, a struggling songwriter trying to get your work published, tell your high self exactly what you want. Visualize your songs already published and being sung and recorded by well-known artists. See yourself in the publisher's office signing a contract. Obtaining physical protection. A point that was overlooked earlier, but we shall mention now. That is the power pranic energy can generate to give you protection from accidents, injury, and other mishaps. Or protection whilst traveling, or even at home where the peace is threatened by an unpredictable and violent member of the family. The ritual you use is the same as the one described in the chapter on psychic protection. Visualize your physical being absolutely safe and secure in the great pranic circle of light. This will greatly increase your day-to-day -day safety and save you from any unpleasant situations. Lead a charmed life. Daily dynamic use of pranic energy will turn you into a literal magnet for good luck and fortune. Gradually you will begin to lead what is known as a charmed life, 
for your high self will always be looking over you and responding to your wishes. You will never lack for money. Or for the more important things like love, happiness, peace of mind. No matter how much you feel that you lack at the moment, everything will change to the better, your life and character being flooded with happiness, peace, and fulfillment. If you lack confidence or think you are not good-looking enough to attract the opposite sex, it will not matter. Pranic energy will bring you the person you want regardless of your looks. You just need the faith in its power to do it for you. The author has on her files many cases of ugly ducklings, scooping the local best catch as a result of their using the kahuna system. Forget about what you don't have and think about what you do have, a wonderful, loving high self that can bring you just about anything you want of it if your desire is sincere and realistic. Be ready for opportunity. Lack of good looks, good connections, financial lack, or lack of any kind cannot stand in your way when you have the mighty power of pranic energy working for you. Through pranic energy, your high self will sweep away all obstacles before you in order to materialize your dream. Apply pranic energy sensibly, believe in what it can achieve, and the rest will happen automatically. And always be prepared for the high self to manifest the answers you seek in its own way. Often its way can be quite unspectacular, even mundane. It is up to you to take advantage of every opportunity that presents itself that could lead you to a fulfillment of your goal. You must be ready for whatever way your desire is to be fulfilled. And you may find it fulfilled in various stages, rather than in one fell swoop. Not always will a command for £1,000 suddenly and spectacularly appear through the post in the form of a check for that amount. This kind of response from the high self is more the exception than the rule, although, as we have seen from one or two of our case histories, the high self does sometimes react in this manner. One must be prepared for anything and everything. In the case of a desire for £1,000, the high self may respond by means of a new and better paying job presenting itself. This in turn could lead you to unexpectedly meeting someone who will in a strange way be instrumental in causing the appearance of the sum of money you need. Any and all possibilities have to be considered. Be prepared. Be alert. Be ready. Whatever you do, do not worry about how your high self will materialize your goal. That is not your business. Trust your high self. It knows how to get anything. Leave it to get on with the job without you poking your nose in by worrying and doubting its abilities. Trust between the three selves is essential to creating inner harmony and organization for the attainment of goals, just as trust is essential between any group of individuals who desire to accomplish common objectives. Offer thanks daily. A few final words to this chapter. Get into the habit of daily offering praise and thanks to your high self for all its help and guidance to you. Even when there is a time when you do not wish any specific task to be accomplished, commune with your high self in an attitude of love and gratitude. Offer prana to it in gratitude. In this way you will build a harmonious and loving relationship with your high self, which will repay you a thousandfold. Avoid being like the child who only comes to its parents when it wants something. The greatest thing that you can learn from the ancient kahunas is the art of true communion and unity with your high self. Not just for the attainment of temporary worldly riches, but for the sheer joy and bliss of coming to know the true and eternal you, your high self. This recording of Pranic Energy, Mystic Power of the Ancients, by Julia Sanderson, was presented by Stargate Book. Sound recording copyright 2023 and produced by Deep Sin Limited 2023.